Right, the committee is, will now consider the Social Security 2007 measures number two, Bill 2007. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Seward. Thank you, Chair. I move Greens Amendment 1 of sheet 5394. I won't prolong this any longer than necessary because people are well, well aware of the arguments on principal carers. This is to um, amend the inequities in the Act um, around principal carers to ensure that parents that are um, in the, in the either 50-50 carers or the difference in percentage of responsibility for the care of a child between two parents is 12 per cent or less, that they both have act access to the principal care provisions. Um, and ask through you, Chair, um, the Minister, he was in the process of updating us on the review of the principal, uh, the review of this um, issue that the department um, has, is undertaking as I understand it. So if I could um, request what status that review is at at the moment. Minister. Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Oh, Senator Wong. Just to facilitate this debate, I just wondered if the minister, in responding to Senator Seward, could also respond to my request as to whether or not the government has undertaken any cost assessments of the implication of this amendment. Minister. Um, in regard to Senator Seward's uh, uh, question, um, I'm unable to provide uh, and I'm able to give further advice about the status of their investigations into the statistics in regard to that matter. Uh, but as I said, it was taken on notice. So rather than trying to do it again, it was taken. I understand that it is still under active consideration, and I'm able to report further, further than in the situation where Senator Betts was able to take the question on notice in regarding to a previous bill. And unfortunately, I can't remember the name of the bill. Um, uh, Senator Wong, um, if you can just give me two moments just to check on one last thing. No, there, there are no, there has, there's been no formal costings of those arrangements at this stage. <coughs> For the benefit of the chamber, I'll indicate the opposition's position on this. And uh, this matter has come up previously, um, Senator Seward, and uh, I think through you, um, Mr. Acting Chairman, uh, I hope Senator Seward is aware that we are also concerned about the intersection, uh, about this issue. Uh, in the absence of being able to cost this particular amendment, we're not able at this time to support this, this specific amendment. However, I do place on record, as I have previously, Labor's recognition of the anomaly which exists in the current legislation and our concern uh, as to the effect uh, on children. Uh, of, of the government's rather odd administrative arrangement where it appears to be whoever gets there first <laughs> gets the principal carer status. Uh, I've re previously raised our concerns with this in estimates. Our position is well known. Uh, but we are of the view that uh, we do need uh, to uh, be very clear about what uh, effect the detail of this amendment would have. Uh, and if elected, um, um, we would <coughs> Uh, address or uh, consider this issue. Uh, as my colleague Senator uh, uh, Ms Macklin in the House stated, we are closely monitoring the impact of the intersection of the welfare to work laws, laws the importance of principal care and status, uh, and the promotion of shared care under family law uh, to ensure to make sure that parents with largely shared care and responsibility are not disadvantaged. Senator Seward. Um, this issue, while I with all due respect, I can understand the um, opposition is at the moment being very careful of commitment makes on financial arrangements. This is about the well-being of children and fairness and ensuring that parents are equally able to look after their children. There is a clear um, anomaly between family law and between welfare to work. C clearly. A set of parents are suffering as a, as a result of that, of that anomaly between the two acts, and we're sending two, as a, as a society and as legislators, we're sending two separate messages to, to community and to parents. And that is, on one, we think you should be equally shared parenting, and that's, been a, that's now law under the Family Law Act. But on the other, under, under Welfare to Work, we're saying only one parent is actually 
decide to be the principal carer and has, and has the right under the Social Security Act to get benefits to enable them, under, if they're on income support, to be able to properly parent. Only one parent can do that. It's clearly inequitable. This inequity has been identified from the start from this Act, and I'm glad that the government and the department is is, is reviewing this, but I'm concerned that the, reviewing, the review seems to be taking a long time. I was hoping that this might be third time lucky with this amendment because this is, I think it's the third time I've put this amendment up. Um, I was, well, I put a reference to committee on a separate issue three times and the government finally saw the wisdom of that referral yesterday and supported our referral third time lucky, so I was hoping the government would see the wisdom this time third time lucky, but obviously they haven't. I would like a time frame on when this review is going to take place or be finished, because as I've pointed out on other occasions, the number of children caught up under this is likely to be substantially increasing as the Family Law Act kicks in. As more orders come through the family law process of the equal, now the assumption of equal shared parenting, there will be more parents that are now having family law orders and, parent, and establishing parenting plans that actually do 50-50 or within the 12 per cent. So how soon can we expect government to have actually completed their review and um, take some action on it? Minister. Uh, I'm unable to provide that uh, information at this time, but I think it's a very reasonable question, and it will take some time, as you can imagine, to work out exactly when it's over. It's just in the middle, so I, if you're happy, uh, Senator, I'd much prefer to take that on notice, and I'll get back to you about some sort of a time frame in terms of those uh, scrutinies. Senator Seward. Thank you. I, I couldn't honestly say I was happy with the further delay. I do appreciate the undertaking, but I'm not happy that it's taking so long, but I do um, but I do appreciate the further undertaking and look forward to hearing in the very near future what the, um, the answers. Well, just prior to me putting the amendment, I'd ask if it's the wish of the committee that the statements of reasons accompanying the request be incorporated in Hansard immediately after the request to which they relate. Is there any objection to this? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the Australian Greens amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the no's have it. Uh, Senator Seward. I seek leave to move Greens amendments 2, 5, 6, 9, 14 and 17 of sheet 5394 together. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, the question is that uh, 18, 25 and Oh, that items 2, 4, 8, 10, 17, 18, 25 and 33 stand as printed. Senator Seward. Uh, thank you. These amendments relate to the minister making um, ministerial guidelines by legislative instrument. Um, I went through the substantive reasons for this during my second reading speech. Um, we have deep concerns um, around the fact that these um, highly complex assessments don't lend themselves to such prescriptive um, and rigid guidelines. Um, while um, uh, we do have, um, while we believe, and we also believe, sorry, that they need to be subject to uh, public scrutiny, we um, believe this is not appropriate mechanism to achieve what the what the government is trying to achieve. Um, and I'll just add, while I'm on my feet, that we we I've, I've heard the um, argument from the from the um, ALP also, um, and I and we don't believe that this is we don't accept those arguments necessarily either and believe that these are rather a clumsy way of dealing with these issues and are deeply concerned about um, the power being put into the the, the uh, minister's hands in these matters and how it then affects the discretion um, of uh, job capacity assessments and also appeals following the following the process as well so um, we believe um, these, uh, these amendments are inappropriate, and that's why we're seeking to um, have them removed. Senator Wong. Thank you, um, Mr. Acting Chairman. The, uh, <clears throat> uh, as Senator Seward identified, I outlined our position in relation to the legislative instrument set of amendments contained in this bill in the second reading debate. Uh, I understand the, the concern, particularly given this government's form. 
Uh, I understand the concern raised by a number of uh, advocacy organisations, uh, including through the Senate inquiry process. Uh, can I say again, our view is that many of the concerns that Senator Seward to which Senator Seward refers really deal with the content of instruments that we have not yet seen. It is not possible in really to assert that um, uh, there are no appellate uh, or review pa um, capacities uh, unless you have a look at the content of the legislative instruments. Uh, we, come, we come at this come from the perspective as a matter of principle that there, there is um, uh, benefit uh, in having uh, these prescriptions included in legislative instruments which are disallowable by the parliament. I accept that the Australian Greens have a different position on that. Uh, and I again place on record that if uh, the government is returned uh, and if the government does proceed down this path, that we will be very closely monitoring or closely looking at the content of what is contained in those legislative instruments to ensure uh, that some of the detail, some of the issues that have been raised uh, by the groups which have communicated with us uh, are addressed appropriately. The question is that items 2 to 4, 8, 10, 17 and 18, 25 and 33 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, Senator Seward. Uh, thank you, Chair. I seek leave to move green amendments 3, 4, 7, 8, 10 to 13 15 and 16 of sheet 5394 together. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Seward. Thank you. These uh, amendments um, also seek to um, change the definition of, fam of family law order similar to, the, to what we tried to do um, in the uh, amendment in the, uh, the bill number one, Social Security Amendment Bill number one. Um, so I won't bother repeating the arguments other than. Other than uh, I would just like to, um, through you, Chair, um, just ask um, the Minister, uh, as I understand his answer previously, was that this is the first step, the family law, um, changing the family law orders was the first step in dealing with the kinship care issue. Has he got a timeline of when, the, when it's possible that, that further the, the process of reviewing the statistics and making further possible changes um, would be taking place as well? Minister, I understand, as I've related earlier, uh, Senator, the, uh, and that's the reason I gave you the answer earlier. They're very similar amendments, and my apologies for that. Um, uh, I guess my, my answer remains the same as the other one. They are under current consideration. Uh, we said this is the first tranche. We're continuing to consider these these matters, and as I've said, I'll try to get a timeline for the first tranche of that. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure if I'll be able to to get a uh, a position for the remainder. I'm not sure what sort of consideration that's under, and I probably a little reluctant to sort of make some undertaking to provide that. But if there is sufficient information available, I'll ensure that it is provided along with your first request. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. Senator Seward. Uh, thank you, Chair. I move Green Amendment 18. Of sheet three, uh, sorry, five three nine four. This relates to um, the impairment impairment tables. So again, um, I articulated in our in my second reading address. We have um, very strong concerns about the issue around the, um, the removal, the replacing of the word medical assessor um, with assessor. And um, in particular, as it relates to, and, and while we have broader concerns across um, many many areas of disability, we are particularly concerned around the issues around mental health. Um, the, this um, we believe is already an issue of concern in the in the community in terms of how um, mental health issues are dealt with um, under under the disability provisions, and are deeply deeply concerned that in fact this is going to exacerbate exacerbate those issues. Um, these, the concern around these amendments were raised by a number of community organisations um, and submitters to the, you know, to, in, to the Senate inquiry um, and we share those concerns and believe again that this is a clumsy way of dealing with um, impairment ratings and believe 
um, and urge the government to go back and have another look at it, look at this issue, and therefore we're opposing the amendments the government's trying to bring in with these um, amendments. The quiz, uh, Senator Wong. Thank you. Uh, I uh, indicate uh, that uh, we, the opposition, have already circulated an identical amendment in relation to this issue. That is opposing the removal of the term medical officers in various provisions uh, relating to the assessment process for uh, entitlement to the disability support pension. I've outlined in my second reading speech the reasons for that, so we have moved a, an amendment uh, that is in fact in identical terms to that of the Australian Greens, so obviously we'll be supporting this amendment. Uh, can I say it was interesting watching uh, the debate in the House of Representatives on this matter where, frankly, the minister's argument uh, was uh, to the <laughs> almost entirely self-contradictory. On the one hand, saying uh, that this, in fact, made no change. Uh, on the other hand, trying to explain why the change was a good idea. Uh, we we do take um, very seriously the concerns raised by organisations such as the Mental Health Council and the Australian Federation of Disability Organisations on this. Uh, the minister in the other place and the minister representing today tonight have, have, have made similar remarks that uh, try and brush away those concerns. Can I say it is very clear uh, that uh, the position of the government or its interpretation of its amendments is not accepted by significant community groups uh, in this sector uh, and uh, we, we continue to press for these amendments as previously outlined. Uh, thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, minister? Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, Senator Wong. I'm unaware of the, uh, the debate in the other place, but uh, um, I can see not only by the notes in front of me, but I think from some common sense, I'm, I'm advised for a couple of reasons that when we're talking about the issues staying the same, in terms of we're not diminishing the role of, of what we would consider, general terms, a medical officer. A, uh, when, when the changes aren't going to prevent a medical officer. Uh, from involvement, and they're not going to reduce the importance of medical uh, information in relation to the uh, to the assigned impair impairment ratings. Um, it's important to note that uh, a job capacity assessor is in fact instructed by the Department of Human Services guidelines that they must take into account all relevant su supporting material, including the treating doctor's report. So it's specifically they are specifically required to do that. Um, when we're making an assessment in terms of uh, a particular disability and how it has an impact on people's capacity to provide a certain amount of work, uh, clearly there are aspects outside of a medical office capacity, for example, speech therapists and a whole range of allied health professionals. The, the intent of this is there is no mischief. We are simply attempting to ensure that a whole suite of, of assessments that can be made uh, are available for consideration. And uh, this amendment provides for just that. The question is, Senator. Well, there are just. A, I don't want to prolong this debate, but really, let us be clear what these amendments are. They they remove or they delete the reference to medical assessors. So uh, it, it is really beyond logic for the government to say we're not diminishing their role. Uh, what is clear uh, is that uh, there is. Um, a removal by virtue of these amendments of a presumption in the, in the Act that a qualified medical practitioner should conduct certain assessments, particularly the assessment of impairment rating using impairment tables set out in Section Schedule 1B of the Act. That is the purpose of this. So the government can engage in a whole range of sophistry about this, but fundamentally they are deleting the reference to medical officer in the Act, so they cannot say oh, that they remain as important. Uh, and they then say, oh, well, the job capacity assessor can have a look at what medical officers say. Let's be clear, we, we in the Labor Party don't believe uh, that uh, entitlement to disability support pension should entirely be determined by medical assessors, but we do think for the purposes of assessing the impairment against the impairment tables, that is a function that ought be undertaken by medical assessors, and that is the concern that is being raised by the disability organisations. The government's response to that, frankly, response to that frankly does not go to the argument. The government's response does not go to that argument. Uh, it is uh, these amendments we do not believe should proceed, and, and I again remind the chamber of the dissenting report from Labor Party senators in this inquiry uh, that, uh, that this aspect of the bill should not proceed. Minister. 
again, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I support uh, uh, the good senator in, in her uh, uh, in her interest of, of, of moving on from this argument. I do know there's been much on it, and I, I have to confess I don't have uh, uh, the, the hindsight of listening to the other contribution in the other place, uh, uh, Mr Chairman. But uh, again, I'd reiterate uh, the term uh, assessor is not, it does clearly also includes a medical officer. There's, there's no question that the term assessor would be included by a medical officer. And uh, again, I would, uh, I'd uh, point you to the position that uh, a, a job capacity assessor is instructed by the Department of Human Services guidelines that they must, it's not a choice, it's not a may, it's one of those, it's a must take into account all relevant supporting material, including the treating doctor's report. Um, I, uh, uh, I, I am informed, and as I read it, and I've read the notes around this, uh, uh, Senator, is that um, uh, that the, the current situation where a medical officer, this is just simply being able to give uh, the assessor the capacity to refer to other assessors, and I think we'll have a more comprehensive assessment of that, and given the recognition of the complex needs of the assessment at that end of the spectrum. The question is that items 37 to 46 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Suva. I think we're moving to Australian Greens Amendment number 19. Yep. Thanks. Um, thank you, Chair. I move Greens Amendment 19 of sheet uh, 5394. This relates to um, we're opposing the application of section um, 12. Um, we don't, again, um, I won't take too much time because I articulated our opposition to this amendment in my second reading speech. This allows the Secretary this um, section 12 allows the secretary to deem a person to have made a claim for a different income um, support payment where a person becomes qualified for it. Amendments to section 12 provide there can be no claims resulting from that section more than 13 weeks prior to termination under that section. We have very strong concerns about this. We see no requirement for this amendment. Um, some of the, some of the, um, because some of this legislation and some of the entitlements are quite complex, very often people don't know um, where uh, they're in, due for entitlements um, or that they, in fact, can be on another um, provision under the, under the Act or that they're, or that they're actually eligible for, for other payments. Um, when the government changed the back pay provisions um, for carers for disability, um, we expressed similar concern that, in fact, that they were restricting um, people's capacity to um, to receive back pay in extremely difficult circumstances. Essentially the same arguments apply and we think this is quite mean-spirited and, and don't support it um, and think it's unfair to put, put that restriction um, on people. So um, we believe this uh, amendment should be opposed um, and urge the government, again, to rethink it. I'll also point out that community organisations writing, um, making submissions to the inquiry, pointed out the unfairness of this amendment and didn't, didn't think it should go ahead and urged the committee to rethink it. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. The question now is that the bills stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bills be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Social Security Amendment 2007 Measures Bill No. 1. Uh, bill 2007 and a related bill and agreed to them without amendments. Minister. I move that the report from the committee be adopted. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister? I move that the bill be read a third time. The, uh, the, the question is that the bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Uh, and those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark? Social Security Amendment 2007 Measures No. 1 Bill 2007. Social Security Amendment 2007 Measures No. 2 Bill 2007. Government Business Order of the Day No. 5 Telecommunications Interception and Access Amendment Bill 2007 Second Reading Adjourned Debate. Senator Kirk. 
Quorum not present, ring the bells. Yes, quorum present. Uh, Senator Ludwig. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I seek leave uh, to table the uh, Telecommunications Interception and Access Amendment Bill 2007. Uh, is leave granted? There is no objection. Leave is granted, Senator Ludwig. Thank you. Um, Senator Stottis Spoyer. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I think I will follow Senator Ludwig's lead, and I will also seek leave to uh, incorporate my speech to this legislation into the Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. S um, Senator Seward? Senator Seward. Okay. The um, Greens have a, uh, some substantial issues uh, with this particular piece of legislation. I know the government sought to have this uh, legislation um, dealt with as, as non-controversial legislation, but we believe that it has some significant implications for the community in terms of um, in terms of its ability to um, access the the, the in, in interception and access um, capacity um, of this legislation, we um, think that it's been rushed through the through the um, rushed through the uh, legislative process and believe that it needs. Um, some um, further amendments. The Greens will be seeking to move, um, or uh, will be seeking to um, move some amendments on this particular piece of legislation. <laughs> and I think that our spokesperson on these issues will probably be able to deal with this particular piece of legislation in a much more comprehensive matter, manner than I'm able to. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. On behalf of Senator Bishop, I seek leave to have his remarks on this legislation incorporated in Hansard. It's leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Nettle. Um, thanks. <laughs> well, I suppose I, I could seek leave to incorporate. Senator Nettle, are you seeking leave to incorporate your yeah. speech? Is it leave? Well, so, uh, well, I'll give it then. <laughs> Are you seeking leave? Well, I don't know. What, do, I get, do I have leave? I'm on. I'll just check. Is leave granted? There being no right. objection, leave is granted. You've incorporated your speech. Minister? Minister? Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. I will um, um, do more than incorporate. Um, in and I thank senators for their contribution. 
2005, an independent report prepared by Anthony Blunao recommended the development of a single overarching legislative scheme re regulating access to telecommunications interception, stored communications and telecommunication data. Simply put, the bill gives effect to that recommendation. The bill does this by moving relevant provisions of the Telecommunications Act 1997, regulating the disclosure of telecommunications data to law enforcement agencies through the Telecommunications Bracket Interception and Access Act of 1979. In addition to these amendments in cons to consolidate the regulation of access to communications, the bill also includes amendments to allow the use of telecommunications interception in the investigation of all offences related to child pornography. This change reflects the seriousness of child pornography offences and also recognises that these offences are, via committed, are committed via communication networks and are most effectively addressed through access to communications. I pause to say that, um, if I may, it is important to stress that this proposal does not represent new, new powers for security and law enforcement agencies, rather it creates new, more systemic and appropriate controls over the existing access framework. The bill has been considered by both the Senate Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills and the Senate Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs, and I thank senators on both committees for their, for their work, diligent work and the matters they raised. I note that the Attorney-General tabled a revised explanatory memorandum in the other place to address the matters raised by the Scrutiny of Bills Committee. The Government has also considered the recommendations of the Senate Legal and Constitutional Committee in relation to, the, to ensuring appropriate privacy protections. The Committee made several recommendations that I will briefly address. The first was that for, crim for the CrimTrack agency to be removed as an enforcement agency. The Government does not agree with this recommendation. CrimTrack plays a valuable and growing coordination role providing assistance to the Commonwealth, the states and territory agencies in criminal investigations in its role as a provider of national information services. It is for this reason that CrimTrack has always been an enforcement agency in inverted commas, under section 282 of the Telecommunications Act 1997. The transferred provision simply updates the agency's name. Secondly, the committee supported the use of the communications access coordinator's determination-making power to provide guidance to agencies on how they should take privacy matters into account in authorising access to prospective data. The government remains committed to privacy protection and supports this role for the communications access coordinator. In this context, I note that the bill requires consultation with the Office of the Privacy Commissioner when developing this guidance. Thirdly, the government agrees that the committee's views on the role of the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security uh, IGIS. The Inspector General already has extensive oversight powers, and this will be able to, uh, and will be able to use these powers with respect to ASIO's, with respect to ASIO's use of the proposed regime without the need for additional legislative provision. The fourth recommendation of the committee is that the Attorney General's Department arrange for an independent review of the Interception Act within five years. As the Attorney has previously indicated, the government does not support this recommendation. While regular review is important, experience shows that the pace of technolo technological change alone continues to drive regular re-examination of the Act. In fact, there have been ten such reviews in recent years, five by independent officers and five by committees of the Senate. The bill is, all, is, another, is another significant step in making sure that Australia's laws for accessing telecommunications information for law enforcement or national security purposes keep pace with a rapidly changing telecommunications environment. This bill dramatically clarifies the regime by collect, by co-locating relevant provisions in a single regime. This will provide a more transparent, understandable regime for agencies, the telecommunications industry and the public. I thank senators for their contribution and commend the bill to the Senate. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have, the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Telecommunications Interception and Access Act 1979 and for other purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it's so ordered. Senator Stott Despoyer. Thank you, Chair. Uh, to facilitate proceedings, I will uh, move Democrat Amendment No. 1, standing in my name, to this legislation. Uh, as uh, senators would be the aware um, from my second reading speech notes, which I'm sure they'll duly read in retrospect through the Hansard, the Democrats uh, have voiced, significant, uh, voiced our concerns about significant privacy implications and invasions of this bill. Given the invasion of privacy that we believe this legislation allows, we believe that access should be limited and only to those agencies that can justify the vesting of such powers. We believe that CrimTrack is one agency that's actually been unable to justify its vesting with such powers. It's not a law enforcement agency authorised to conduct investigations into suspected offences except in limited circumstances related to spent conviction legislation. So effectively, Madam uh, Chair, this deletes uh, subsection 1M from the proposed bill to uh, remove CrimTrack from the definition of, uh, of an enforcement agency. 
Senator Ludwig. Thank you. Uh, we oppose the Democrat amendment. Uh, it may be, and perhaps it's unfortunate, that this matter uh, progressed a little bit further since the Senate uh, committee, and we're in a better position to understand uh, some of the uh, nuances of the debate. But whilst acknowledging that CrimTrack does not have uh, the investigative powers of a traditional enforcement or security agency, we note that CrimTrack does play a vital specialist role in assisting law enforcement. It is for this reason that we think it should remain within the bill's definition of an enforcement agency. I won't go through what CrimTrack is. I think most in this chamber have heard uh, what CrimTrack does, it, and it does it uh, well. But since November 2004, CrimTrack has been brokering census direct access information on behalf of all policing jurisdictions and other criminal enforcement agencies to provide them with uh, pertinent information about telephone subscriptions when investigating, preventing and prosecuting criminal offences. Access to this information is governed by various processes and procedures according to the law enforcement agency requesting the information. Enforcement of criminal law covers a wide spectrum of activities and depends on the organisation to which the investigator belongs. CrimTrack currently brokers that on behalf of all policing jurisdictions across Australia, including the AFP. In addition, CrimTrack also brokers telecommunications data on behalf of the number of other law enforcement agencies, which include the Australian Customs Service of New South Wales, Independent Commission Against Corruption, the Crime Misconduct Commission of Queensland, the Australian Crime Commission and the Australian Securities Investment Commission. The current application used by CrimTrack is a simple forward, reverse and address-based search on behalf of those law enforcement agencies. By undertaking these agencies, CrimTrack ensures that all organisations are legitimately entitled to have access before approving individual on a case-by-case -case basis. Access is granted to individuals, not organisations, work units or teams according to their responsibility and rank. It goes without saying that that supports uh, clearly in Labor's view why CrimTrack remains central to requiring uh, uh, to be within this jurisdiction and have that access given its direct role. I won't go to any of the uh, further reasons which support that given the nature uh, of what I've just said and the time available. Uh, if uh, the Democrats wanted to dispute it further, I can provide more evidence to justify the position. Minister. Thanks, Chair. Look, uh, the government doesn't accept this amendment, obviously, and it comes as no surprise to uh, the Honourable Senator. Um, given the general prohibition on the disclosure of telecommunications information in the Act and the Privacy Act, requirements that information is only used in relation to the purpose for collection, CrimTrack's ability to undertake this role is directly linked to its inclusion in the definition of an enforcement agency within the legislation. The removal of CrimTrack from this definition would mean that agencies would be required to establish their own infrastructure to access inf this information, increasing the burden on smaller agencies to develop their own contractual arrangements with information providers. Obviously, this would divert resources, be inconvenient and undermine the purposes of the Act. The question is that Democrat Amendment No. 1 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Stop the Spoyer. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I might seek leave to move the remaining amendments two and three that both relate to uh, judicial warrant uh, uh, being required for access. Um, I seek leave to move those together. Leave granted. Okay, there everyone looks no very happy about that. Leave um, is granted. Thank you, Chair. Access to prescriptive to prospective telecommunications data we believe has the potential to allow real-time monitoring of location information, uh, i.e. Uh, an authorisation for access to such data amounts to, in effect, a de facto uh, surveillance device. Accordingly, we believe that access should be subject to the same uh, scrutiny um, and, indeed, judicial oversight uh, as application for surveillance devices under the Surveillance Devices Act. So, at a minimum, we're saying to the government uh, and, indeed, to, to the parliament, if you insist on having this kind of uh, legislation and this particular um, access or powers for law enforcement uh, agencies, then at least ensure that you've got a couple of uh, safeguards, uh, some basic safeguards in place and make sure that they're, I mean, they can at least be comparable to those that already operate under the surveillance device, devices act. Um, so therefore, um, obviously we're amending sections 176 of uh, ASIO and 180 enforcement agencies to require that access to prospective information by these organisations uh, requires a warrant.
Senator Nettle. Thank you. The Australian Greens support these amendments because, um, as I said in my second reading speech and I've indicated before, um, our concern is that what this bill does is allow the government to have access to telecommunications data that they don't currently have. Currently, they require a warrant to tap phone calls. We don't think that they should be able to have access to the information about who you're calling, where you're calling from and what website you're accessing without having access to a warrant. So we think that the same regime that operates requiring a warrant for telecommunications should operate in relation to this additional information that is now available around your telecommunication because, um, because of the way mobile phones and the internet operate. So we think the same system should apply across the board um, and that's why we support these amendments. Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you. Uh, the opposition uh, doesn't support the uh, two amendments. The new provisions in the legislation distinguish between access to historical telecommunications data, that is data which is already in existence at the time of the request, and prospective data, that is data that is collected as it is created and forwarded to the agency in what is commonly referred to as near real time. Access to prospective telecommunications data is only available to ASIO or criminal law enforcement agencies because of, and quite rightly, the high privacy application of this type of access. But it doesn't come without uh, more. Access to prospective telecommunications data would require a higher threshold of authorisation, allowing for future access to telecommunications data, and that is covered in the proposed sections 176 and 180. The need to distinguish between historical and prospective data is a reflection of, in fact, the advanced technology that exists, which enables the use of telecommunications data to provide, amongst other things, uh, location information. But it also then provides, to reflect the increased privacy implications of access to prospective data, three more restrictive conditions which are attached to these authorisations. One, restricting the disclosure of prospective telecommunications data to an authorised officer of a criminal law enforcement agency for the investigation of offences which attract a maximum term of imprisonment of at least three years. Two, limiting the time frame for which an authorisation may be enforced to 45 days for criminal law enforcement agencies under proposed section 180 and 90 days for Asia under proposed section 176. And lastly, number three, authorisation on the privacy of the individual. Uh, thirdly, requiring the authorising officer, I should say, to have regard to the impact of the authorisation on the privacy of the individual concerned. In respect of the warrant issue raised by the Democrats, uh, we don't support the position that's being put, and I'll leave that to the government to deal with. Minister. Thanks, Madam Chair. In response to um, um, Senator Stott the Spore and the Democrats and uh, Senator Nettle and the Greens, um, can I say the government obviously doesn't agree to this amendment as it is unnecessary based on, if I may be so bold as to say, an incorrect understanding of the provisions um, and likely to be confusing into the future. Can I emphasise that these are not new powers, notwithstanding media reports which clearly disclose, the Sydney Morning Herald springs to mind, clearly disclosed a, t a total lack of understanding and an inability to digest and comprehend what this bill does. Uh, and a bit sad, really, that such an important issue can be so misconstrued and misunderstood by journalists. Telecommunications data has been available to law enforcement and ASIO since 1975. Advances in technology have meant that telecommunications data has become more detailed and that the data can be provided in less time than in the past. In response to these new capabilities, the bill introduces new provisions which for the first time explicitly regulate the technological change that has occurred. The distinction between prospective data and historical data has not been created to allow access to a new class of data. It is a response to the privacy implications that have arisen out of the existing legal regime. It places new limits on access as well as new reporting requirements. Um, the regime to enable criminal law enforcement agents to access prospective data is already based on the equivalent surveillance device warrant. Under the Surveillance Devices Act of 2004, an, an, an appropriate authorising officer, as defined and set out in that Act, may authorise the use of a tracking device without a warrant for in, in instances where it will not involve any interference with the, the property of a person, as set out in section 39. A warrant is only necessary where covert entry to a, to a premises or a vehicle is required. 
Prospective data authorisations have similar requirements to these surveillance device authorisations with the express purpose of ensuring that the integrity of the surveillance device regime is maintained. Now, I set this out because there is a degree of hysteria and misunderstanding surrounding what we're actually doing here. I can only repeat, these are not new powers. Senator Nettle. Thanks. Can I just ask the minister, does that mean that you're already getting the information about where someone's making a phone call from and who they're making it to without access to a warrant? Minister. In certain circumstances. Senator Nettle. What are those circumstances? The Telecommunications Act. The Senator Nettle. But the tele This is a new. Like there are two things that are being said here. In one lot of comment from the government, you're saying, like in the explanatory memorandum, you're saying this is a new thing that we're doing. Now you're making an argument forward to say this is not something new. Okay, I appreciate your honesty to the question in saying you're already doing this. Um, now I want to understand the circumstances. And the answer to me to say, as per the Telecommunications Act, the Telecommunications Act doesn't currently have, as you described, this regime for regulating this piece of, this, these pieces of information about where you are and who you're talking to on the phone. So can you give me some more detail about the circumstances where you're already doing this? Minister. Look, 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 there's no great art or secrecy or oppression of privacy rights here. Location information has always been available as part of the telecommunications data provided by carriers, as evident from any mobile phone bill. That, that, to the suburb, that, you know, the, the tower, that's all we're saying. The bill recognises that the speed of delivery of this information is increasing the potential of this type of information. That's what it's about. So is the new part the transfer of that information to police and ASIO, or is it that it occurs in real time? Minister. It's new protections because it can now occur in real time, and the objective is to have it in real time. There's not much point in terms of counter-terrorism and other things um, being able to access the stuff after the bomb's gone off. Follow me. The question is, Senator Stotts-Boyer. Thank you, Chair. I'm glad the, um, the minister um, made those last comments. With, I mean, in terms of clarifying that this is a new scheme for dealing with that prescriptive, prospective data, um, a new scheme for access to prospective data um, and, and information um, and, and documents for, for ASIO and for law enforcement agencies. So it is a new scheme in that regard. And I understand that, you know, and I think most of us understand that, you know, there is an element here of trying to establish some kind of privacy right or regime. The Democrats would put on record that one of the issues here, one of the problems, both in terms of what exists now in the Act and what we're talking about in terms of this new scheme. For, uh, for access to prospective data is the reluctance, the inability or the unwillingness to, and I've heard the arguments as to why, the government won't define the, um, the, the scope or define telecommunications data. And I understand that partly because this is considered, you know, the technology, it's innovative and it's hard to keep up with and therefore, you know, we can't, you know, readily or easily define telecommunications data. And I have some sympathy for that. I mean, I understand that particular reason, but it also makes some of this lawmaking um, a, a little difficult as well. And I think some of these issues might be resolved if the Attorney General and the government were more willing to try and see if they could, in some way, come up with a, a definition of, uh, of telecommunications data. I don't want to open up that debate because I know it's an ongoing one, and we've all read reviews and we've had this debate before. But I just want to put put that. Um, You've, certainly through you, Chair, to um, Senator Ludwig acknowledge he's tried it, we've tried it. Um, I don't think we're going to resolve it tonight, uh, Madam Chair, but I just want to put that on record in relation to the debate that was happening between Senators uh, Nettle and Johnston. The question is that Democrats' amendments two and three be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Tobi wäre vor oder ready? Lock the doors, lock the doors. The question is that uh, Democrat Amendments 2 and 3 on sheet 5380 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Bartlett uh, teller for the ayes, Senator Parry teller for the noes. Order. There being seven ayes, 51 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I believe we're, I'll, I'll report to you. The uh, question now is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is now that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Telecommunications Interception and Access Amendment Bill 2007 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. Madam Acting Deputy President, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that the report of the committee be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. 
that the bill be now read a third time? The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Telecommunications Interception and Access Act 1979 and for other purposes. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day number 6, Communications Legislation Amendment, Information Sharing and Data Casting Bill 2007, second reading adjourned debate. Senator Webber. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. On behalf of Senator Conroy, I seek leave to have his second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Webber, Senator Conroy has a second reading amendment. Could you be moving that? Oh, no, so, no, and I also will formally move his second reading amendment. Okay. It's moved. Senator Parry. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I also have a second reading speech that I wish to seek leave to have incorporated on behalf of Senator Alan Eggleston. Leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. The question before the chair is the second reading amendment from Senator Conroy. Is there a ministerial statement? On communications. Senator, Senator Conroy. Sen Senator Colby. <laughs> Senator Colbeck. And you guys are seeking cooperation. Um, thank you, Madam, Madam Acting, Acting Deputy President. Um, I seek leave to uh, incorporate my closing remarks in Hansard and uh, commend the bill to the Senate. The, second, the Senator Conway's second reading amendment is before the chair. The question is that that amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. The question is, the question is that the bill may be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to communications and for related purposes. Minister. The bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to communications and for related purposes. Clark. Government business order of the day number three, National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Bill 2007, second reading, adjourned debate. Senator Wong. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Bill 2007. This bill establishes a single national framework for reporting greenhouse gas emissions, emission reduction actions and energy consumption and production by corporations from 1 July next year. A greenhouse reporting bill is necessary to underpin a national emissions trading scheme and federal labour has a long-standing commitment to implementing emissions trading as a sensible and flexible approach to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It recognises that this legislation is fundamental to what we believe should be a growing partisan approach, bipartisan approach to tackling climate change. That is why Labor was surprised and disappointed that in the first instance the Environment Minister introduced such a sloppy bill into the House of Representatives, uh, in, evinced in part by the, the fact that the government was required to amend its own legislation. Labor re recognises the urgent need for progress on emissions trading but that does not excuse poor process or lack of consultation. Emissions trading is a significant economic reform, particularly as we need to address dangerous climate change and we need to ensure that we get the underlying structures right. The bill before the chamber has a range of forced shortcomings. A major concern is the provision for the all-powerful Commonwealth reporting power to potentially usurp or marginalise state laws and programs. And in the absence of Howard government leadership on climate change, the fact is the state governments rather than the federal government have led, has led, have led the way and their efforts should be supported rather than handicapped. This power is clearly unnecessary. Additionally, the thresholds and timelines are loose and slow so as to prevent a soon and as soon as practical introduction of emissions trading. Perhaps this was to be expected given the government's plan for a slow and modest start to emissions trading by 2011 or 2012. 
Uh, the Chamber will be aware that Labor if referred this bill, which was introduced with very little notice, to the Senate Standing Committee on Environment, Communications, IT and the Arts for review. That Senate inquiry uh, heard that the bill was put together without due consultation over a few weeks between July and August. Now, clearly, the, that is simply uh, insufficient time to produce legislation as important as this, and really follows in the footsteps of many previous bills that this government, since it attained control of the Senate chamber, have rammed through without proper consideration. Uh, the mo most famous one in recent times, or in the term of this parliament, was of course the Work Choices legislation, which had a number of hundred amendments introduced uh, just about 20 odd minutes before it was debated in this chamber. Uh, the point about that is, regardless of the politics of it, it is frankly sloppy legislative work by a government that doesn't feel it has to do that work because it has the absolute control of the Senate chamber. Extraordinarily, in the context of that inquiry, the department admitted they had not consulted specifically with any of the stakeholders during the drafting of this bill. Now, perhaps this should come as no surprise, given the hasty way in which this legislation was introduced by the member for Wentworth uh, previously into the parliament. A notable, a notable um, example of the Minister for the Environment's approach to these matters uh, would be the draft water bills. Not even the National Farmers Federation or environment groups nor the state governments received an opportunity to look at that bill before it arrived in the parliament. And it was only when Labor insisted on the need for a Senate inquiry that this matter of na substantial national significance was given at least some detailed consideration. Uh, to be frank, and through you, Madam, Acti Madam Deputy, Acting Deputy President, this government's practice of dumping proposed legislation into the Senate with little opportunity for due and proper consideration really confirms just how out of touch this Howard government is. All of the stakeholders who gave evidence to the inquiry identified significant problems with the bill. The inquiry heard, amongst other things, that the bill could deliver unintended consequences, such as significantly raising compliance costs, producing a fractured system which may not include all major emitters, obliging companies to seek judicial review, undermining both current and future state laws and programs on climate change, uh, many of which are working effectively, and potentially cutting across other state laws and programs not at all connected to greenhouse gas emission issues. A number of representations to the Senate inquiry, including from environment organisations, made the point that the reporting thresholds had all the appearance of being too loose and that it was critical that more information be publicly disclosed about the reporting under the proposed legislation. I note that the Investor Group on Climate Change, which represents uh, some $370-odd billion of funds under management, uh, was critical of the fact that the stipulated time frame is so slow. As the bill is being rushed through the parliament, uh, it is worth the chamber considering the particular reasons why this legislation has been rushed through. The answer is very clear. Until it believed it was politically necessary, the Howard government has done virtually nothing at all over its 11 long years in office to address climate change. There has been a systemic pattern of denial and inaction on climate change, and that systemic pattern goes to, amongst other things, the question of setting up Australian businesses and the community to deal with climate change and the establishment of a market within which to operate so that emission reductions can have value. It is a matter of record that on a number of occasions in the past the Howard government have had the opportunity, has had the opportunity to consider emissions trading. These have included receiving cabinet submissions on that very matter, which were rejected. And now what we see is how the Howard government suddenly realising that climate change is a matter of real interest to, those in, to the Australian community. Well, it's very interesting. I'll take that interjection, Senator Colbeck. He claims that, you know, it's a, that uh, he, he's making some assertions about the Labor Party's position on this. Uh, you are the government that is filled with climate change sceptics. You are led in this chamber by a senator who has made clear he questions whether or not human activity has had any, effect, any impact on climate, changes, on climate change. We know that this government, both in the cabinet and on the back bench, is filled with people who still remain sceptical about the reality of climate change. Is it any wonder 
that you have been asleep on this issue for 11 years. So, Senator Colbeck, if you and other ministers in this government uh, want to come in here and lecture and try and make a political point, perhaps you should look at yourselves. Because you know what, the Australian people, the Australian people know. The Australian people know who has put climate change on the agenda in the political scene, and the Australian people know that the only reason, the only reason this government is doing anything at all when it comes to climate change is because of the upcoming election and because this government believes or recognises that it needs to be seen to be doing something uh, in order uh, to try and deal with the perception that they have done nothing over 11 years. It is all about spin. It is all about the election. It is all about politics. It is not about good policy. It is not about genuinely understanding and believing that climate change is a real challenge to this country. Uh, it is not about recognising the economic, social and environmental challenge faced by cli that, that, that climate change constitutes. It is all about political spin. Uh, just like uh, we saw the the water announcement in January being being announced without the matter, without those aspects of those pa that package going to Treasury or finance or costing. What we see for costings, we see yet another hasty, uh, politically motivated response from the Howard government, a government that has been asleep on the issue of climate change for 11 years. Really, what we are seeing is a government that is now introducing legislation in an attempt to show that it is reacting in some way to the deficiencies of its past, uh, which has really arisen as a consequence of the government not being willing to embrace emissions trading as one of the ways in which we can tackle climate change. A sloppy bill like the one that was presented uh, to the chamber really tells us pretty clearly that at the time it was introduced, Perhaps it was the case that the Environment Minister uh, didn't really have a chance to look at it closely himself. The bill in, it, in the form uh, that was introduced to the House of Representatives has the potential to increase uncertainty due to unintended consequences, including the introduction of legal ambiguities in relation to some of the clauses proposed. I, I want to go back to, for a moment, I want to go to the issue of the government's approach to climate change and the inconsistencies in their approach in general. Only last week, or recently, in relation to the government's position on the ratification of Kyoto, we had the Environment Minister saying uh, in the other place, and I quote, Kyoto may be amended, and we hope it will be. We will, we will be part of that. We want to amend Kyoto. That is what the Minister for the Environment, Mr Turnbull, said uh, in the other place in a recent debate. It really is an extraordinary statement, because for the last 11 years, what the Howard government has been all about has been bagging Kyoto. It has talked about, it has been critical of Kyoto. It has talked at various times about the Eurocentrism of this multilateral agreement. It has been denying and decrying those who claim that Kyoto has an important role to play in addressing climate change. Uh, and now we have Minister Turnbull saying Kyoto may be amended. We hope it will be, and we will be part of it. It would be useful to, to know whether or not the minister could explain how the government proposes to be part of Kyoto if, it, if the government continues to refuse to ratify it. That really is the key question that how government needs to answer. How are they going to be part of amending the Kyoto Protocol when the government in the first place refuses to ratify it and therefore cannot play, take a place at the table and vote on the protocol itself? So what we see is the Howard government getting itself into an extraordinary, illogical and ridiculous situation on this issue. It is no wonder that international commentators and political leaders look upon the position that the Howard government has taken on the Kyoto Protocol with some bewilderment. They have got themselves into a tortured, convoluted and contorted position when it comes to Kyoto. And at the same time, of course, I remind the chamber of the comments, of various comments made by the leader of the government in the cha chamber. Senator Minchin uh, is on the record as saying, and I quote, Kyoto is a failed doctrine. Therefore, by definition, it is doomed to fail. So that was the government's previous position, that is, it is that Kyoto is a failed doctrine and therefore, by definition, doomed to fail. The question that we need to ask ourselves, and that no doubt Australians who are interested in this issue will ask themselves, which is the government's position? They clearly are confused when it comes to the Kyoto Protocol. Either it's a fa failed doctrine or we should commit ourselves, as Minister Turnbull has, to amending Kyoto. 
I want to also um, raise an issue in relation to the Sydney Declaration, uh, which occurred recently at the APEC um, meeting, uh, and which the government has trumpeted as some great reform. In July last year, in a speech to the Committee for Economic Development of Australia, the Prime Minister said, and I quote, a central flaw of Kyoto is its reliance on a distinction between developed and developing countries, which makes little sense when translated into global emissions. But the, Sid the Sydney Declaration actually put this view and said specifically, the future international climate change arrangements need to reflect differences in economic and social conditions amongst economies and be consistent with our common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. That, in fact, is the Kyoto approach. Article 10 of that protocol says that all parties should act, taking into account, I'm quoting here, taking into account their common but differentiated responsibilities and their specific national and regional development priorities, objectives and circumstances. So really the Howard government's position has been on, on the Kyoto Protocol on climate change has become one of the most farcical public policy positions that the, any federal government has ever had. It is being exposed day after day as contradictory statements by ministers such as those as I've outlined. And in, and in addition, notwithstanding the fact that the Prime Minister had been hostile not, not only to the idea of ratification but also to the notion that it would be the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that would be the appropriate pathway to build multilateral agreement on climate change treaties in the future, what we now see is the much-trumpeted Sydney Declaration, including a specific recognition that the UN framework is the acknowledged and accepted pathway for future, future global climate change negotiations and formulation. So what we know about the Howard government's position on climate change and on the Kyoto Pro Protocol is that they are all over the place. Uh, and as I said previously, I suggest to the chamber the reason they are all over the place on it is they don't believe it. They don't believe it. They are filled with climate change sceptics. They are filled at senior levels with people who do not believe that human activity has, has impacted or has had an effect on climate change or has contributed to climate change. And this has infected their public policy response. Theirs is a response driven by politics, and that is uh, alone not by belief and not by public policy considerations, uh, and that is why their position is frankly incoherent and inconsistent. There is one further thing to note in this debate on this bill. Uh, that is, as a consequence of the public policy position taken by the government, we have seen an impact on the Australian economy. It is unfortunate there has not been sufficient attention paid to the economic consequences of this government's failure to embrace clean and renewable energy in Australia. But all, and also because of its blind-minded and blind-eyed approach to the issue of Kyoto ratification, its denial of the opportunities that Australian companies could have and should have to be involved in clean development mechanisms, joint initiatives and other measures that are linked to the protocol. And the fact is, under the Howard government, renewable energy companies have voted with their feet. In August, Last year, we saw a company closing its wind turbine assembly plant in northern Tasmania. The cost was 100 jobs, that is, 100 Tasmanian jobs went as a result of that decision. In February 2007, Pacific Hydro announced that it was investing $500 million in Brazil because Australian renewable energy projects have been stalled by the government's refusal to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. So I invite the parliamentary secretary who is handling this bill, who is a Tasmanian senator, is he supportive of the fact that 100 Tasmanian jobs were lost as a result of the government's position? Is that really his position? Is he seriously saying that it is a good thing because of this government's intransigence and failure to deal with this issue that 100 Tasmanian jobs were lost? There has been a direct economic impact and a direct economic burden on our country uh, and on Australian workers and in Australian industry as a consequence of the government's position. Can I make the point that the same company that closed its wind turbine assembly plant in northern Tasmania has subsequently announced its Portland factory will close in December 2007 because further investment cannot be viable in current market conditions? And the reason uh, of the, for the unviability is that the Howard government has failed to establish a market to enable which, in which these companies can operate and to provide, to provide the necessary services for reducing emissions and providing at the energy at the same time that many countries and that many of our competitor economies have begun to do so. As a consequence, 
there is no sorry there is no market here for these companies to undertake these activities and as a consequence these companies are stranded and stuck and investment goes offshore and jobs go with it there is a very strong business case that lies in Australia accessing the Kyoto Protocol. There are lost opportunities associated with emissions reduction projects. There are lost opportunities associated with the clean development mechanisms in other countries. And the fact is, under the Howard government, Australia and Australian companies uh, continue to miss out. There is the opportunity for this nation to become a regional leader by establishing low carbon projects in Australia that can generate carbon credits to other countries. There is an opportunity for this nation to become a regional hub for a global power carbon market, which is what many Australian businesses would like to see. For, unfortunately, all of these opportunities have gone begging as a consequence of the Howard government's stubbornness in respect of climate change its refusal to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. And, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, in relation to this bill, I move the second reading amendment that has been circulated in the chamber uh, in my name on sheet 5393. Senator Allison. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, to rise to speak on the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Bill 2007. The uh, Democrats support the objectives of the bill, which is to centralise uh, and standardise the reporting requirements, reduce the burden and the bureaucracy associated with reporting, and to make public greenhouse and energy data um, make public that is greenhouse and energy data while maintaining confidentiality. There is a crucial need for data and reporting on both greenhouse gas emissions and energy consumption in order to effectively inform policy development and energy market reform. This data is essential for the evaluation of government policies and programs and for um, the government to be able to measure and assess the performance of policies and evaluation uh, if these uh, policies are achieving the objective of the greenhouse emissions reductions. Uh, the initiative is long overdue. The government um, is very late, in fact, in the game of collecting data on greenhouse emissions and energy consumption. State governments. Uh, on the other hand, are already requiring energy consumption reporting in order to administer their own greenhouse and energy programs. In fact, the initiatives of the state and local government um, organisations uh, far outreach the climate change policy initiatives of uh, the federal government. Uh, those, some of those state initiatives include the Victorian Renewable Energy Target, the Victorian Energy Efficiency Target, the New South Wales Greenhouse Gas Abatement Program, and the South Australian Feed-In Tariff. So state initiatives would not be required if the um, Australian government was uh, taking a genuine, uh, genuine action on climate change. The government's climate change policy is not informed by accurate data. Uh, it's also not informed by economic modelling and therefore um, is not strategic. A recent survey undertaken by the Australian Industry Group revealed that only one out of ten Australian companies knew how much uh, greenhouse emissions they're producing and felt they knew enough about climate change to manage the risks to their own businesses. Only a quarter of these companies have tried to save water. Companies surveyed admitted that they were poorly informed about how to cut their greenhouse gas emissions or how climate change might affect their businesses. The 70% um, of companies surveyed believed uh, they had a responsibility to reduce their greenhouse pollution and were willing to use their money uh, and, um, um, and uh, uh, sorry, were willing to, to use their own money and to increase the cost of their business. As the Australian Industry Group Chief Executive, uh, uh, Ms Heather Riddart, points out, there is a need for industry and the wider community to understand their obligations to be socially responsible, but the risks to industry competitiveness uh, must also be managed. Australia is one of the biggest wasters of energy in the world. Um, our demand for electricity is growing unchecked by almost 2.5 per cent a year. By 2010, greenhouse emissions from the stationary energy sector are projected to be 153 per cent above 1990 levels. Australia's energy consumption is projected to double by 2050. So there is a, an urgent need for an annual investment um, of 
uh, $6 billion in infrastructure, money that would be, available, would be better spent uh, in other areas if we achieved even modest levels of uh, reductions in um, energy use and energy efficiency. Energy efficiency can make deep and co cost-effective cuts in our fossil fu fuel use, uh, our greenhouse gas emissions, and it could reduce these high levels of energy waste. If our energy demand continues to grow unchecked, then renewable energy and clean energy development uh, chase a receding target. Just 1 per cent energy efficiency target uh, reduction um, reduces the need for um, eight coal-fired power stations and could permanently defer the need for nuclear power stations. The European Union has just set a 20 per cent energy efficiency target by 2020. And if Australia adopted this achievable target, we could permanently defer the need for any nuclear power stations and reduce our greenhouse emissions, pay less on our electricity bills and cost effectively transfer to renewable energy. Not only that, but energy efficiency increases jobs, lowers inflation and improves our economy. The uh, current energy market framework doesn't serve this outcome. We still have the 1990s market and uh, an energy market rewarding even increasing en ever increasing energy demand and not addressing waste. So we must remove barriers to and allow participation of energy efficiency and distributed en uh, generation in the energy market. Energy efficiency is a clear frontline climate change policy and lowest cost greenhouse abatement action is available, but not even the simplest actions and policies are being implemented by the government. So there is a clear market failure here for greenhouse energy efficiency and renewable energy. State governments, as I said, and even the environment groups uh, are well ahead of um, this government in undertaking cost-benefit economic modelling for greenhouse action. This bill represents a step in the right direction and the Democrats look forward to the data being used to inform government policy so that at least we can catch up with the efforts of the states on greenhouse. Thank you, Senator. Senator Milne. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise this evening to make some remarks with relation to the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Bill 2007, legislation intended to establish a national framework for reporting greenhouse gas emissions, certain abatement actions, as well as energy consumption and production by corporations from the 2008-2009 financial year. And uh, in rising to speak to this bill, I note that the Australian Greenhouse Office in 1998-99 went to great lengths to develop a framework for emissions trading and it was shelved. And here we are all these years later, in the last sitting day, right at the end of the last sitting day of this government that we have brought into the chamber legislation to set up uh, arrangements to actually measure greenhouse gases. And I think that gives some indication of where we have, have been under the Howard government in relation to climate change. And uh, before I actually go into the substance of what I want to say, I would like to uh, put the government on notice that there's one aspect of this legislation I would really appreciate uh, an explanation of, since uh, we're not going to go into committee, or unlikely to go into committee, I'll just uh, give notice now so that hopefully the uh, the government representative, Senator Colbeck, uh, responding to this might be able to give some explanation to the House in a minute uh, in relation to it. And it's particularly uh, with regard to um, clause 27, page 27 after line 12 after subclause 1, where there's been an insertion uh, regarding the Greenhouse and Energy Data Officer who may refuse to dis disclose information under this section if satisfied that there would not be adequate security measures in place in relation to the confidentiality of the information. And given that there are already secrecy provisions that govern these arrangements, I would just seek an explanation when, uh, when eventually the government responds. Now, I return to, uh, to my remarks. We should all remember that uh, the Kyoto Protocol uh, signed in 1997, and here we are a decade later, 
and we are just beginning the process in Australia that the rest of the world has been engaged in for a decade. When Minister Robert Hill came home from Kyoto a decade ago, he boasted to the Australian community about what a fantastic job he had done in browbeating the rest of the world in achieving for Australia an increase in greenhouse gases on 1990 levels when the rest of the developed world all accepted cuts. And the reason the developed world finally accepted in the middle of the night Australia wearing them down was that the rest of the world wanted Australia in the tent. And so they decided to compromise and to allow Australia an increase. In the subsequent years, Australia continued to frustrate at almost all of the UNFCCC and Kyoto Protocol meetings. And it wasn't, of course, until 19, uh, 2005 that the protocol was ratified. And Australia took so little interest in this process that even in this last week, the minister representing the prime minister in this house told the Australian people that China had still not ratified the Kyoto Protocol. Well, let me inform the government that China not only signed but it ratified some time ago, and that China has been the recipient of substantial funding under the Clean Development Mechanism. But let me go back. Once Kyoto was signed in 1997, there are three financial mechanisms under the protocol that then needed to be worked through. One was the Clean Development Mechanism, investment from developed countries into developing countries. The second one was joint implementation, investment from developed to developed countries. And the third was emissions trading. And over this last decade, that has been worked through substantially. The Europeans developed their pan-European trading system and they made some serious errors. And one of the errors they made was to trust the corporate sector to appropriately uh, calculate the level of their emissions. And what occurred was that the corporate sector inflated their emissions in order then to be able to come in underneath the free permits that they had been given and therefore trade in the market in what was essentially a, a false uh, carbon saving. And so what we learnt from the emissions trading system in Europe is that it is desperately important if you are going to have an emissions trading system for that system to have integrity and the integrity has to come from the measurements that you have uh, put in place. And that is why the legislation here is so important and that's why it, it disappoints me. Because if you are going to deal with greenhouse gas emissions and we have to deal with it and we have to deal with it urgently, the science tells us we have to deal with it urgently. Only this week the Antarctic scientists are telling us that the ice melt both in the Antarctic and the Arctic is going much faster than any scientists anticipated. They're telling us that the IPCC report, for example, failed to incorporate ice melt and that the likely sea level rise is going to be much higher than the 59 centimetres predicted in the IPCC reports. So we know that we are faced with a catastrophe, and I don't think the government actually believes that. And even if it has now come round to believing that climate change is real, I do not get a sense from the government that there is any urgency. And urgency is the key thing, because the scientists are telling us that global emissions have to peak by 2015 and then reduce. And there is no suggestion that's going to occur because under this legislation, emissions trading doesn't get up and running until 2012. That is way too late. The Europeans have been into it for a long time. Several states in the northeast of the United States have set up their own emissions trading system. They are all working together to try and make sure that they are consistent so that the, when we get to a global emissions trading system, there will be an easy knit of those systems. Australia is now in a position, having uh, learnt from the experience of the Europeans, to do something comprehensive. But emissions trading of itself is insufficient to address greenhouse gas reductions, and that's the other problem with this legislation, that it is in isolation from a comprehensive policy framework. And we've had that already. Emissions trading will not drive renewable energy rollout in Australia. 
You have to have not only a price on carbon, but you also need a mandatory renewable energy target high enough to uh, secure investment, and you also need feed-in laws. Feed-in laws which give you a guarantee that, that the energy utilities will purchase renewable energy at a fixed price for a fixed period of time. You also need to look at this issue of land use, land use change in forestry. And again, we saw an example of that today where the government has rushed ahead with tax laws and fortunately they're not coming into this House. And again, as a contempt that the Howard government has for the Senate, the House of Reps has gone home because they know that there is a majority of go the government in this place and it doesn't matter what we might want to do to amend legislation, they've got the numbers to block any amendments and so they've more or less thumbed their nose at the Senate and gone home. And I hope that the community realises that having a majority in both houses is a very bad idea for good legislation because you don't get it if you don't allow scrutiny of legislation through committees and then or through amendments. But I return to the issue of, uh, that is in front of us with this particular uh, bill. And as I was indicating in terms of that tax bill, the idea of addressing land use, land use change in forestry by bringing in a tax deduction for so-called carbon sinks without requiring permanence of those carbon sinks, without putting a time frame on it, is just a pork barrel for the plantation sector. And indeed, a plantation sector in this occasion, which will come from the cement industry, the coal-fired power stations and from the aluminium sector. So as if it's not bad enough that we've got the MIS schemes out there distorting the market, we will now have the cashed-up energy sector investing in the establishment of trees without any hydrological analysis, without any requirement that those plantations be in any way biodiverse. And the worst part about it is without any requirement that they stay in the ground for any length of time. And if you have a situation where you call a tree planting a sink and then you can log it at any time, then it makes absolutely no sense and makes zero contribution to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So what you need is a comprehensive, integrated framework of policy which looks at emissions trading, which looks at land use, land use change and forestry and how that will intersect with food security, how that intersects with ecological integrity and, and uh, ecosystem maintenance in terms of water, but you also have to look at the financial mechanisms that will drive the rollout of renewables and you need regulation that will set in place national energy efficiency targets, energy efficiency standards for appliances, for buildings and so on. With this particular bill, the government made a huge mistake by absolutely squandering the goodwill of the states. The states had gone ahead and developed a lot of work in terms of emissions measurement, and they were going to go ahead with a national emissions trading system in the absence of the Commonwealth uh, doing so. They agreed at a COAG meeting. They agreed at that particular meeting to establish a mandatory national greenhouse gas emissions and energy reporting system on the understanding they were prepared to give up some of their powers on the understanding that the Commonwealth would consult with them adequately and that there would be an agreed system. And the minute that the Commonwealth got that, the Prime Minister announced his emissions trading task force and without any further ado or consultation with the states, the Commonwealth just drew up its legislation and made a total mess of it. And I am delighted that at least there was a one-day hearing where Senator Wortley from the Labor Party and uh, myself sat there all day and questioned everybody who came, and I'm grateful to all the representatives from state governments who came, and clearly there was an overwhelming case that Clause 5 of this particular legislation had to go because effectively it was overriding the states and undermining their ability to keep going with the good initiatives they had in place and the need for the states to be able to continue to collect appropriate data. And so that evidence was so overwhelming that I am pleased to say that as a result of the Senate inquiry, the government amended its original bill and has at least now recognised that it is not going to be able to override the states in the way that it wanted to. But secondly, 
The bill, as it was previously drafted, said that the, uh, that the energy uh, that the, uh, the federal government officer who is overseeing this only may disclose information to the states, not must disclose. And again, after considerable evidence, I'm pleased to say the government has now moved to, to understand that the, the uh, federal government must disclose information to the states. And furthermore, the states wanted reassurance that where there was some dispute about information being freed up for the states, that there would be an appeal mechanism. And I'm glad to see that that also has been incorporated. But the issue I really would like an explanation. It's important for the states that this is on the record that we would like an explanation of under what circumstances, what is meant by the energy data officer's capacity to refuse to disclose information if satisfied there would not be adequate security measures in place in relation to the confidentiality of the information. It's really important we get an explanation from the government in this uh, second reading debate as to what that means because otherwise the, the uh, comfort that the, the government has given the states in terms of replacing may with must will be undermined by this, uh, this particular clause. So I would appreciate knowing from the government uh, what is actually meant by that. But just to return to my other problems with this bill, as even though I, I welcome those changes, one of the real issues for me that remains is that the essential elements of a reporting scheme include comprehensive coverage of emitters, data at both corporate and facility level, reporting on a range of relevant activities, transparent and objective processes for calculating emissions and public accountability of the scheme. And that is not actually included here because uh, having um, given in to the Australian Industry Greenhouse Network, who desperately did not want public disclosure at a facility level, we now have a bill which Although the data will be collected at the facility level, there is no requirement to disclose it to the public. There is only aggregated totals across company levels, and that is not going to give the public what it wants in terms of being able to hold companies to account. And I think that is a mistake. And I also think that uh, what we're going to have is no, transpar no transparency now for the public to know how emission permits are going to be allocated. Because there's no doubt, uh, even though there's an overwhelming body of evidence to stay, say that all pollution permits should be auctioned, there's no doubt that uh, the view is that a number of them will be allocated free unless you can have absolute transparent reporting at both facility and aggregate level. How can the community have any confidence uh, if in the absence of that uh, transparency in the integrity of any scheme? And I think that is a real mistake. I think the thresholds are too high. They should have been much uh, more stringent. And also, there is no need for the phase-in over three years, as is in this bill. We should have been able to move much faster than that. And that's why I say I just don't think the government gets the urgency of dealing with climate change. I don't think the government understands we are facing dangerous climate change. And when, in the face of that, we have to act quickly, we cannot sit around and wait for another several years to get this underway. And my only, uh, if you like, uh, insurance on this is that if there is a change of government, hopefully we will be able to come back and amend this so that we put it in the context of a holistic set of measures on climate change, which will include land use, land use change and forestry, which will include the big emitters but be much more comprehensive because the thresholds will be different, that will get more urgency into the debate and more transparency. Because I think that uh, if you don't have that transparency, then you are going to end up with no public uh, confidence in, in the system as it's currently uh, set out. My uh, other issue in uh, relation to uh, the community right to know is not in this bill. And I think that, um, as I indicated, that information at facility level is part of the community's right to know. And only a total gross greenhouse gas emissions and energy produced and consumed being made public, you'll find that the people in Australia are going to be very angry that you're setting up a reporting system 
which allows for the information to be reported but to be kept secret uh, from the community. The other issue is that in the terms of auditing, we wanted to make sure that external auditors were accredited to avoid uh, conflicts of interest, and the same applies to, um, to the Greenhouse and Energy Data Officer. There must not be a conflict of interest in any shape or form for that position because it's a critical, an absolutely critical position. But also, in order to get uh, transparency and appropriate compliance and enforcement, it's critical that there's the opportunity for random audits and that the auditors be accredited so that we don't have self-regulation effectively which has undermined quality control in so many industries across Australia and of course it's why the community has so very little confidence in the uh, land use, land use change and forestry sector because it has been uh, self-regulated for a long time. I just finish by making the point that I don't think the government fully understands what a mistake it has made in squandering the goodwill of the states. Because to get an effective emissions trading scheme, you have to have cooperation at all levels of government and confidence at all levels of government that there is going to be a collaborative approach and that there's going to be a fair system. And the states most certainly felt that they had been done over and knifed was the word one of the states used by the Commonwealth. And that is not the way to begin to set up the basis of what will be an extremely significant financial mechanism in addressing climate change. And so I welcome the, the changes the government did make. I'm sorry that the transparency isn't there, the facility level reporting is not there, but I would appreciate from, uh, from the minister the, an explanation of what was meant by that uh, amendment that I referred to earlier, and I hope that will give some additional comfort to the states that this isn't a backdoor means of restricting information to them. Sister Birmingham. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to support the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Bill 2007 and seek leave to incorporate my second reading speech for this bill. Is leave granted? There be no objection. Leave is granted. Senator Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. On behalf of Senator Wortley, I also seek leave to incorporate her second reading speech in respect of this bill. Is leave granted for incorporation? There be no objection. Leave is granted. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, at the outset, uh, the revised explanatory memorandum I think has not been tabled, and I now table that. Um, to answer Senator Milne's question in relation to the disclosure of the states and territories, can I say it's not intended uh, as a device that a member is not intended as a device to restrict information to the states and territories. Um, the government takes very seriously its responsibility to protect the very detailed data it is now requiring Australian companies to report. Uh, this will include data that could convey detailed information about the production activities of a company, the technology it uses and the processes used, used by companies and the, uh, the position of the company in relation to uh, emissions generally. Uh, the government's intention is to make all of this information, including commercial and confidence information, available to the state and territory governments. Now, that is the intention. But what we do intend is that it be protected sufficiently, and that's what this amendment is about. Uh, the government's got a responsibility to ensure that adequate safeguards are in place prior to handing that information over to the states and territories. So I can assure Senator Milne that this is not a device to restrict information to the state and territory governments. It is to make sure it's provided, but in a secure environment, bearing in mind that this could be quite sensitive information. Mr Acting Deputy President, my remaining remarks uh, uh, are by way of summation of the debate, and I would seek leave to incorporate them. Leave granted. There is no objection. Leave is granted. So the Senate now has before it a second reading amendment moved by Senator Wong. The question is that that Labor Party amendment be agreed to. Those of the pending say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. So the question now is that the bill be read a second time. Those that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to provide for the reporting and dissemination of information related to greenhouse gas emissions, greenhouse gas projects 
energy production and energy consumption and for other purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the, be, the bill be taken as a whole? There have been no objection. It is so ordered. The next question is the bill standards printed. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The next question before the Senate is that the bill be reported. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The committee has considered the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Bill 2007 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. I move the bill be narrowed a third time. Question, does that motion be agreed to? That's been say aye. Those against say no. The report of the committee be adopted. Be adopted. Well, there wasn't much of it. Question, does that motion be agreed to? Those opinion say aye, those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I now move the bill read a, be read a third time. Question, does that motion be agreed to? Those opinions say aye, those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. The bill for an act to provide for the reporting and dissemination of information related to greenhouse gas emissions, greenhouse gas projects, energy production and energy consumption, and for other purposes. Government business order of the day. Judges' Pensions Amendment Bill 2007 and an associated bill. Second reading, adjourned debate. I call Senator Ludwig. Thanks very much. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Judges' Pension Amendment Bill 2007 and it's cognated with the Federal Magistrates Disability and Death Benefits Amendment Bill 2006, as I understand it. Labor supports the contents of these bills. They in fact, uh, largely contain technical amendments to the formula by which the superannuation of former federal judges is payable. Currently, uh, upon the death or retirement of a federal judge, a formula operates to reduce a judge's pension by averaging the rate of surcharge that applies to the judge in each full financial year of his or her service. The Judges Pension Amendment Bill makes four technical amendments to the current scheme. Firstly, it amends the reduction in the reduction for the years 2003-04 and 2004-05, which, according to the explanatory memoranda, brings the formula into line with the maximum surcharge for those years. Secondly, the bill amends the formula regarding invalidity, uh, invalidity pensions to take into account the abolition of the surcharge from 1 July 2005. Thirdly, the bill allows that the spouse of a judge who dies in office may choose between having the judge's pension reduced under the formula or a computation scheme. Fourthly, the bill allows the trustee of the judge's pension scheme to draw on an existing special appropriation for the payment of judge's surcharge debt to the ATO as they retire. In terms of the Federal Magistrates' Bill as well, turning to it, basically what the Federal Magistrates' Bill sets out to achieve is to enact a pension scheme for magistrates who are no longer capable of doing their job for medical reasons. This would allow magistrates who have served on the bench to retire because of ill health and receive a payment. In effect, it would help to make their position more consistent with other federal judges. Given the difficulty in removing judges on the grounds of poor health, this is a sensible option. It removes the incentive for magistrates to continue on in their position after ill health it may make it untenable and, in so doing so, will help maintain the exceptionally high standard that currently exists in the Australian federal judiciary. At the moment, federal magistrates operate under a separate scheme to the pension scheme that exists for other judicial officers, which is the uh, Judges' Pension Act 1968. The federal magistrates receive a superannuation fund, a retirement savings account, to which the Commonwealth contributes. What this means is that if a federal magistrate retires before the age of 65, then they are not eligible to receive a pension. This creates an incentive to continue work even if illness or disability prevents them from effectively performing their job. The proposed legislation will alter that and allow the magistrate who retire for those reasons have access to a continued source of income via the judicial pension scheme. Specifically, it will allow a magistrate who retires post-retirement to request the Attorney-General to certify 
that the retirement is due to permanent disability or infirmity. This is modelled, of course, on the process that occurs for other judges under the Judges Pension Act. A refusal to certify would be appellable to the Minister of Appeals Tribunal. Where the request uh, is granted, then the magistrate in question would be eligible to receive a pension at 60 per cent of the federal magistrate's salary until they reach the age of 65. They would continue to be eligible to receive a superannuation contributions from the Commonwealth until that age as well. And turning to the more uh, troublesome end, if there's a death benefits scheme, the bill updates the provisions for magistrates' death benefits, bringing them closer into line with those of other judges. It would allow lump sums for uh, death benefits to be paid to eligible spouses and eligible children if a magistrate dies before the age of 65, which would be equal to the superannuation contribution that they would have received had they lived to that age. Magistrates who retire on the disability pension scheme inserted by this bill would also uh, be eligible for death benefits. For the uh, remainder of the, uh, the uh, contribution this evening, I'll refer to primarily the Judges' Pension Amendment Bill. The comments I have are equally applicable, of course, to both these and the Federal Magistrates' Bill, but of course the Judges' uh, Pension Amendment Bill will serve as a single example. That act, as it currently stands, excludes same-sex de facto couples from its operation. Heterosexual de facto couples are, for the spouses of this act, taken to be bona fide married couples if they a, have lived together for three years or more as a man or wife, or b, in the case of less than three years, the Attorney-General, having regard to any relevant evidence, is of the opinion that the person ordinarily lived with that other person as the other person's husband or wife on a permanent and bona fide domestic basis, regardless of whether or not the person was legally married to that other person. Same-sex de facto partners of judges are currently completely excluded from this scheme. And of course, what does that in fact mean? For a married or de facto heterosexual couple, the current sections 7 and 8 of the Judges' Pension Act provide that, on the death of the judge or retired judge, the surviving partner is entitled to a payment of 62.5 per cent of the relevant pension in relation to the judge. It's a reasonably standard clause which exists to ensure that the partner of a judge who has served the judiciary and Australia is not left high and dry upon their death. Unfortunately, as I've already mentioned, it was not drafted to envisage, and it certainly does not encompass, circumstances where judges engage in same-sex de facto relationships. This is, of course, not a situation which Labor thinks is acceptable, and as such we will be moving amendments or foreshadow uh, in this, this speech that we will be moving amendments to ensure in the committee stage that these injustices do not continue. The amendment is clearly within the objects of the bill before us. The bill's long title is a bill for an act to amend the law in relation to judges' pensions and for related purposes. Therefore, being clearly within the stated objectives, Labor brooks no criticism for moving the amendment per se. It is imperative that the parliament take these measures and start moving these types of amendments because the government's, well, basically because of the government's intransigence on the issue of discrimination against same-sex couples. There is no uh, logical reason and no rationale for continuing to refuse access to these pensions for same-sex de facto couples. There is a purpose to this focus. Heterosexual couples may marry and become spousal partners, falling under the definition of this Act. It is enough to be said that it is not the place or role of Parliament to be placing legislative prods in this direction. But following the exclusive definition of marriage in the Common Law in the Marriage Act 1968, same-sex couples are left with no options at all. The transferability of these pensions to a partner of the deceased judge is a recognition of their contribution to judicial life and the immense workloads that these judges undertake during their tenure. The payment is also to ensure that the partners of these judicial officers are not left high and dry in the event of their death. 
There is no provision in place barring homosexual judges from accessing the judicial pension scheme. There is no suggestion that a judge who is in a same-sex relationship is any less worthy of receiving a pension as one who is in a heterosexual relationship. The only thing that is barring is transferring the pension to the other partner is the same-sex relationship on the same grounds that are provided for in a heterosexual relationship. I can point out that the issue of whether or not homosexuality should be legal as well, well, it's well and truly settled, and rightly so. It's over a decade since the Keating government passed the Human Rights Sexual Conduct Act of 1994, which overrode Tasmanian laws which outlawed homosexuality. The debate, I'm not reopening, it's settled. Logically there, there is no reason why the payment of a pension to judicial partners after the judge's death should not be expend, extended to include same-sex de facto partners. Yet the legislation as it stands does not allow for this to occur and to be, well, quite frankly, perfectly frank about this, it's about time for the government to begin the process, to begin the steady march to move the Australian society to extend benefits to persons in de facto same-sex relationships. The government is well behind on these matters, Acting Deputy President. For more than a decade, we've had inaction and no real outcomes for the removal of discrimination against Australians in same-sex relationships at the federal level. The precise dimensions of this discrimination have recently been laid out in a recent report of the Human Rights and Equal Opportunities Commission Same-Sex Entitlements. That report found a total of 58 pieces of federal legislation which discriminated against same-sex couples, and that was only in the area of financial and work-related entitlements. At this point, I'd like to, of course, to add the caveat that in some cases the discrimination may actually be beneficial. Some benefits are reduced where a person is living in a marriage-like situation with a person of the opposite sex and the same-sex de facto relationship do not count for these purposes. So in those limited cases, the same-sex de facto couple might actually gain a financial advantage out of the discrimination. But for the most part, same-sex de facto couples are denied the benefits which are provided to married couples. To remove the discrimination which operates in relation to this Act, I will, as I've said, foreshadow an amendment, as my colleague in the House had earlier done so, Ms Nicolette Roxon, which, who moved a second reader, uh, calling on the government to remove discrimination against same-sex couples in this piece of legislation, which uh, in that House the government did not support. It really is, though, unfortunate because the government has made comments in the media that they will support the removal of discrimination against same-sex couples. And I'd like to take the opportunity of actually quoting some of these. Firstly, a media release of the Attorney-General of June 21 this year in response to the Herrick report, which stated, in connection with the interdependent relationships, including same-sex relationships, the government will consider making further changes to the relevant legislation on a case-by-case -case basis. I also note a statement by the Prime Minister, Mr John Howard, at a doorstop interview on the 8th of June last year, and I quote, I'm in favour of removing areas of discrimination, and we have, and I'm quite happy, on a case-by-case -case basis to look at other areas where people believe there is genuine discrimination. The case we have before us today is about as clear-cut as it gets. There is a clear benefit that is being denied to same-sex couples in a de facto relationship. And in respect of this, it's also narrowly cast. It's a point that's on in the principle that this bill is one which goes to pensions, which goes to this ability to be able to use this opportunity to move this amendment. As the government would be well aware, in some instances we have not supported the progression of these types of amendments in this House because they look like tagging. The costs may be 
difficult to ascertain. The costs may be quite large. The costs are therefore not on them in themselves or alone, but together with the usual principle that I enunciated earlier that we don't generally accept tagging, i.e. finding uh, an amendment to a bill and then using a subsidiary or an unrelated amendment such as this. And I think the government accepts that we generally uh, stick to that principle. And of course it is a reasonable principle to stick to. In this instance, we are on point. We can then move the amendment. And it is, as I've said, narrowly cast. Because we actually have what you could possibly say is an example that should be remedied in this instance. And I'd invite the government to consider it further and more deeply because of this issue is clear. There is the actual example, the High Court Justice Michael Kirby. The government determined only to act on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, there is one. As Justice Kirby himself has stated in a letter to the Attorney-General, if he were to die today, the legislation as it currently stands would deny his partner a judicial pension. Justice Kirby will retire from his judicial career by early 2009, and I stress that we hope and pray, of course, that that does not occur. If he were to die before or after his retirement, the person that he is in a caring relationship with and forged a life with for nearly four decades would not receive anything from his service. This is clear and an ambiguous example of how these laws impact on law-abiding Australian citizens. There isn't a justification in this instance to not agree. I will note again that the Attorney-General has stated that he will look to remove discrimination on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, I'd offer this as a perfect example of a case in which the Attorney-General can act or his representative in the House. Given this government's self-publicised reputation over its truth and honesty with the Australian public, I'd certainly expect that the government would honour this commitment given by Mr Ruddick and support the foreshadowed amendment. However, I'd like to note that there are many uh, amongst us, the Conservatives, who agree with Labor on this position, and even if uh, the right wing dominates within their party, I might add that the uh, lunar right, which appears to be slowly taking over their state branches, does not. So I say to the members of the government in the Senate who support, well, Luna, yes, it's, it's buying at the moon sort of thing. No, There's, I reserve that for a few others. So I say to the members of the government in the Senate who support these uh, types of amendments, uh, don't worry, Labor will be giving you the opportunity to vote and allow your practical record on these matters of the removal of discrimination of same-sex couples to be put on the public record in this case-by-case -case example. Finally, I'd like to deal with the government's criticism that, there was, that was raised in the House uh, main committee on another bill. That was the Federal Magistrates Amendment Bill. And as I understand the comments made by the Attorney General at that time, the government wants to address all of this discrimination at once in one package and that it was not appropriate to tackle these issues of discrimination in the manner we're doing today or as it was then. To this criticism, I'd point out that the government has had 11 years to remove discriminatory provisions in federal legislation. During that time, state Labor governments have moved forward on the issue, abolishing discriminatory provisions in areas such as superannuation and the recognition of same-sex de facto relationships, to give two examples. And let's not forget, of course, their case-by-case -case pledge. Where uh, did that get to? The Attorney-General and the Prime Minister could be described as flip-flopping around on their previous long and deeply held commitment to the reform on a case-by-case -case basis. One minute where it's convenient, it's case-by-case, -case. the next is wait for the package. It's really, in this instance, concerning that the Liberals can't be trusted on this issue. And even if you thought you could rely on a Liberal promise in this area, don't forget there's always the National Party. Federally, Labor has pledged that, if elected, will remove discrimination against same-sex couples across all federal legislation, with the exception of the Marriage Act. 
by way of contrast, this government has been in power for 11 years. The heroic inquiry has been going on for the last 18 months. The report has been publicly available since June. There surely cannot be too many sitting weeks left, and if you believe the Treasurer, at least his first iteration, this is probably the last, before Parliament is uh, dissolved and the general election called. So far, as we've heard from the government is that they will look at the legislation on a case-by-case -case basis. We've not seen a formal response to the Heroic report, and in fact, we've got, at this point in time, uh, no indication if the government is planning to act on it, and in the off chance they will, when are they going to do so? It would be helpful to know. Acting Deputy President, the case that Labor is making here is quite simple. We're in favour of these bills. They have our support. It's a minor technical amendment that fixes some inconsistencies in the scheme. It brings it in line with the maximum surcharge. And Labor is not objecting to the bill per se and the amendments that have been put forward. But in substance, there is an issue here that does give the opportunity of this government to make some practical benefits and benefits to an individual's life, quite frankly. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Mr. Senator Ludwig. Senator Murray. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Um, I st stand uh, in this order to speak on this bill, um, despite the fact that uh, Attorney General's portfolio is held uh, by Senator Stott Despoja for our party, uh, because these bills principally uh, cover the area of superannuation. Uh, and uh, I've uh, been coordinating a particular approach we've been taking um, to these, these bills. Uh, the bills of themselves are, are of course, uh, welcome, and uh, you know, the Australian Democrats do support uh, uh, both bills that are before us cognately. Uh, but we do uh, wish to, and it's another reason I'm here, uh, we do wish to, wish to use this opportunity uh, to draw attention to, uh, again, uh, a gross inequity uh, that exists uh, within present law with respect to same-sex couples uh, and death benefits um, that, that attach to them. The Judges' Pensions Amendment Bill 2007 amends the superannuation surcharge related provisions of the Judges' Pensions Act 1968 and adds a definition of salary to the Act. The Act makes provision in relation to the entitlements to pensions of persons who hold office as judges of the High Court of Australia, the Federal Court of Australia and the Family Court of Australia and certain other office holders who are deemed to be judges for the purposes of the aforementioned Act. Currently, where a judge retires or dies in office with a superannuation surcharge debt, the pension payable to the former judge or dependent or dependents of the former judge, as the case may be, is reduced under a formula in Section B of the Act. The formula reduces such a pension by averaging the rates of surcharge applied to the judge in each full financial year of his or her service. The bill remedies uh, technical deficiencies in the formula uh, in order to apply the uh, correct rates of surcharge in 2003-04 and 2004-05 to amend the tr treatment of invalidity and death benefits and to recognise payments made to discharge uh, in part a judge's surcharge debt. Uh, no direct issue applies to the substance of the bill, uh, but rather the bill uh, provides opportunity uh, to move uh, amendments to uh, what is a um, gross uh, inequity uh, and injustice to the justices, as I might put it. Uh, the media has reported that uh, Justice Kirby has been in correspondence with the Attorney General to request his and the government's support for amending the discriminatory aspects of the Judges' Pensions Act 1968. Justice Kirby's key concern is the fact that his same-sex partner of 38 years will receive no pension entitlements in the event of Justice Kirby predeceasing him. This compares with the partners of other judges who qualify under the marital relationship provisions for a reversionary pension pegged at 62.5 per cent of the pension that would otherwise have been payable to the judge in question. 
In response to media questioning, the Attorney General stated, and I quote, in connection with interdependent relationships, including same-sex relationships, the government will consider making further changes to the relevant legislation on a case-by-case -case basis. We will do this in consultation with the relevant stakeholders, taking into account the relevant legal policy and fiscal impacts, end of quote. All very proper. Uh, of course, uh, it is uh, language to allow for delay and obfuscation. The uh, Herriot Report, uh, that's the um, Human Rights and Equal Opportunities Commission's uh, National Inquiry into Discrimination Against People in Same-Sex Relationships, uh, Financial and Work-Related Entitlements and Benefits, that Herrick report entitled Same Sex, Same Entitlements came out in May 2007 and has been in the hands of the government since then. Uh, I heard uh, in an earlier debate, and I would remind the chamber that this is the 12th, the 12th act we have sought to amend uh, to meet uh, Herriot's criticisms uh, since that report came out. Um, I heard in an earlier deb debate uh, a minister said, oh, well, they hadn't had much time uh, since May 2007. Well, have you seen the range of uh, bills we've had since May 2007, especially uh, budget bills? I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous argument. Uh, and as the uh, shadow uh, attorney general uh, has said, uh, it, it uh, if, if there's any clearer cut case than this particular one, and one, might I say, which isn't very costly, uh, there can be no better example. The, um, the, the report itself, uh, as I say, uh, applies to issues of financial and work-related uh, discrimination on the grounds of, um, of gender preference. Uh, and, uh, by the way, in my remarks, I mentioned the uh, uh, public discussion about uh, Justice Kirby's uh, circumstances, because he isn't the only judge or magistrate in this country uh, who has a different uh, uh, gender preference to, to uh, those which um, are described as heterosexual uh, relationships. Uh, and he won't uh, be the last uh, person of, of uh, that preference, uh, and these are aspects. Uh, which should be uh, beyond discussion. They should simply be cleared up uh, and be available to people uh, in the normal way uh, described. The uh, 58 acts that the, um, the report uh, lists, it, it lists them at the end, um, there are two uh, which, uh, which relate to, to the judiciary. Um, the one is uh, the uh, let me get to the page, the Judges Pensions Act 1968. I'm referring to page 397 of the report. The other is the Judicial and Statutory Officers Remuneration and Allowances Act 1984. At uh, page uh, 384 of, of uh, the report, one in the findings and recommendations, chapter 18, um, the uh, uh, Herioc have, have uh, very helpfully listed the factors that need to be borne in mind. And I have made sure that uh, my amendment, and I, I will relate to it when I come back to it uh, in the committee stage, uh, closely match uh, the uh, way in which uh, Herioc have suggested um, these matters be resolved. I uh, wish to remind the uh, Senate chamber of the discrimination under superannuation laws. We're dealing here with superannuation and death benefits. Uh, just so it can get into your heads just how abominably stupid maintaining this farce of homophobic laws is for a government which carries the word liberal in its name. It is outrageous, and I will concur uh, with the remarks of the Shadow Attorney General. It is my view that many, many, probably most liberals in the Liberal Party, in this parliament, and many, many cabinet ministers are of the view that this discrimination should end. There is cross-party agreement on this, and yet here we are uh, having to try and twist the government's arm uh, to do what is right, proper, and moral, instead of continuing with the kind of laws that the Taliban uh, would enjoy and support. Uh, at pages 380 and 381, 
is, is this list of discrimination under superannuation laws. The inquiry finds that federal superannuation laws discriminate against same-sex couples or families in the following ways. A federal government employee's surviving same-sex partner cannot access direct death benefits, lump sum or reversionary pension available to a surviving opposite-sex partner unless the employee joined the public service after the 1st of July 2005. The surviving child of a lesbian co-mother or gay co-father who was a federal government employee will not usually qualify for direct death benefits, lump sum or reversionary pension available to the child of a birth mother or birth father. It is harder for a surviving same-sex partner to qualify for death benefits and private superannuation schemes as a person in an interdependency relationship than for a surviving opposite-sex partner as a spouse. A surviving same-sex partner cannot usually qualify for a reversionary pension in a private superannuation scheme, which is available to an opposite-sex partner. It is harder for a surviving same-sex partner to access death benefits from a retirement savings account as a person in an interdependency relationship than for a surviving opposite-sex partner. It is harder for a surviving same-sex partner to access death benefits tax concessions than for a surviving opposite-sex partner. A same-sex partner cannot access, access the death benefits anti-detriment payment available to an opposite-sex partner. A same-sex partner cannot engage in superannuation contribution splitting and the associated tax advantages available to an opposite-sex partner. A same-sex partner cannot access the superannuation spouse tax offset available to an opposite-sex partner. A surviving same-sex partner of a federal judge cannot access the reversionary pension available to a surviving opposite-sex partner. A surviving same-sex partner of a governor-general cannot access the allowance available to a surviving opposite-sex partner. Chapter 13 on superannuation provides more detail about these and other superannuation entitlements. And it's not as if this issue is new. Uh, I recall uh, many years ago uh, actually moving an amendment to the, governor, the Act that covers the Governor-General to address this matter. And uh, the reaction uh, was, was that of astonishment. Uh, I have moved numerous amendments on this issue. Uh, over the decade that I've had uh, responsibility in this area, all been rejected. I've been joined, uh, I might say, in a very vigorous and helpful way uh, by the shadow on, on superannuation matters, Senator Sherry, in estimates uh, quizzing of, might I say, a very sympathetic minister. Uh, let me, for the record, uh, put on record my appreciation uh, of uh, the responses uh, that Senator Minchin has given in this area. But he's been defending the indefensible, uh, and he's been defending it because he has not, uh, and, and others of his persuasion have not prevailed in the Cabinet. Um, uh, this criticism of mine is not a criticism of the party, not a criticism of the Liberal Party. It is a criticism of the Liberal Party's leadership, an absolute failure. and. The idea that to address this now would be sensitive in an election environment is just appalling because you could have addressed it the month after the last election or the month after the election before that. I just think it's a failure of moral will. It's a collapse in liberalism. Uh, the days uh, when liberals with a conscience crossed this floor, uh, as they did uh, often, uh, seem to have gone by the board and the conservatives uh, have the party by the throat. Well, I think, uh, like all these things, the dam will burst uh, and the people of good heart in the Liberal Party will prevail. But it is our job, from the crossbenchers and the, uh, and the opposition in, in this case, um, to push the point and to make people feel uncomfortable about an issue which they know is right and proper to, to uh, pursue. So in with my one hand, I want to give you a jolt uh, to, to uh, encourage you to, uh, uh, to face up to it. But on the other hand, I want to give you great encouragement. Uh, I know many Liberals uh, listening uh, to this debate uh, and uh, who, who participate in these chambers uh, badly want to see these issues uh, resolved in the interest of a fair go, old-fashioned Australian fair go uh, uh, treatment. Uh, and now, of course, that we've got the Harriock report, 
we really do have a very thorough and comprehensive appraisal of this issue. So with those uh, words, and uh, you'll be happy to know I'm not going to repeat them all when I move my amendment, I'll simply move the amendment. Uh, I, uh, I want to put uh, the case to you um, one more time this week, the twelfth time this week, we are asking for these laws to be addressed. Thank you, Senator Murray. Senator Nettle. Thank you. I seek leave to incorporate my, my remarks. Is leave granted? There may no objection. Leave is granted. Senator Stott the Spire. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, my uh, remarks uh, tonight deal specifically with the Federal Magistrates uh, Amendment uh, uh, Disability and Death Benefits uh, Bill 2007. Uh, obviously, Senator Murray has pointed out the Democrats have dealt with this both on Attorney General's and, uh, and superannuation lines. And I think you'll find uh, the amendments uh, in my name on behalf of the Democrats dealing with this particular legislation uh, reflect uh, exactly the sentiments that have been expressed by Senator Murray uh, on the party's behalf. So I think, um, oh, and also indicate, of course, that we have amendments dealing with the uh, reduction of the age threshold. So I would also perhaps seek leave to incorporate uh, the rest of my remarks in an attempt to uh, facilitate uh, proceedings and uh, obviously um, have indicated that uh, I'll uh, move my amendments in due time. Thank you, Senator Stott the Spoyer. Is leave granted for Senator Stott the Spoyer to incorporate? There no, being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Anton, Deputy President. Look, I do want to thank senators for their contribution on this, uh, on this bill, these bills dealing with uh, judges and magistrates. The government acknowledges the significant contribution judges and federal magistrates make to an efficient federal civil justice system and is committed to ensuring that they have adequate and appropriate terms and conditions of service. The Judges' Pensions Amendment Bill 2007 is intended to rectify technical deficiencies in the Judges' Pensions Act of 1968 relating to the application of the superannuation surcharge to federal judges appointed between 7 December 1997 and 30 June 2005. And it may not be important to some members uh, on the other side, Mr Acting Deputy President, but I'm sure it's important to the judges and the magistrates. The main objects of the bill are to pass on the reductions in the top surcharge rate in 2003-2004, 2004-2005, and to give judges an option to commute a portion of their pensions to pay their surcharge debts. The Federal Magistrates brackets Disability and Death Benefits Bill 2007 will provide federal magistrates and their dependents with improved financial protection in the event of serious disability or death. It is the government's view that the public interest is served by ensuring that federal magistrates with disabilities which prevent them from performing their duties retire with adequate financial provision. Currently, a federal magistrate whose performance is significantly impaired for medical reasons might nonetheless be unwilling to resign. This is particularly important where federal magistrates have tenure to age 70 and can be removed only on the grounds of proven misbehaviour and capacity. If the performance of a federal magistrate were significantly impaired for medical reasons, it is desirable that lack of adequate disability provision not be a barrier to the magistrate's willingness to resign. Now, I want to just pause briefly to talk about the principal issue surrounding this bill, and that is the issue, of course, raised by Senator Murray uh, and adverted to and raised in the uh, speech by Senator Ludwig. Look, this is a very emotive issue. The emotive issue is that of, of course, same-sex entitlements. And can I say the emotion does, to some greater or lesser extent, cloud the otherwise strong adherence, particularly of Senator Murray, to matters of good government. And um, I want to just say a few things about this uh, from the perspective of what it will mean and the significance of a movement to the recognition of same-sex entitlements. The government is considering the issue of same-sex entitlements in relation to the Commonwealth defined benefits superannuation schemes generally. The government is considering it. As stated by the Attorney General recently in the context of the Federal Magistrates Disability and Death Benefits Bill, it is not appropriate to deal with judicial officers and I would have thought the opposition would accept this in isolation from other recipients of Commonwealth defined benefits such as returned servicemen, public servants and parliamentarians. In short, people will say, people will say, particularly the likely beneficiaries of broad amendments, will say, 
What about us? It's all very well to give the judges and the magistrates same-sex entitlements. What about us? And what about us, in terms of case by case, is something that we need to consider from the perspective of the Australian Defence Force. 55,000 plus about 20, 30,000 civilian employees, 55,000 service personnel, diplomatic officers, diplomatic officers and officers generally, agencies, uh, appointees, and of course parliamentarians. Now, now, and I know this is emotional for Senator Murray, but I'd, I'd like him to hear me out because I want to just point out why the government is at the point it is at now. And it's frustrating, I know. Rome wasn't built in a day, and it'd be lovely if we could just write check after check and satisfy, satisfy every emotional requirement pursuant to people who, who seek to be a beneficiary under the superannuation schemes of the Commonwealth. But can I say that, firstly, in terms of, in terms of each of the, of the matters before um, the Commonwealth on a same-sex basis, there are vastly different budgetary considerations from department to department. There is an impact, and of course, and of course, and of course, I note, I note, Senator Murray rolls his eyes when I say that. But this is a government that now has the capacity to satisfy, now has the capacity to satisfy same-sex relationship because it has been considerate of budget considerations, because it has minded the budget. Now the point is, the point is, we don't just write checks. We don't just write checks, and we don't write checks on each bill. We don't write checks on each bill because we're going to feel good out of it. We don't write checks because it's a feel good. What we do is we bring into this place good policy that has equity across the board. Equity across the board. Now that's something I would have thought Senator Murray would have liked to have related to. Why would judges' partners? Why would judges' partners? be any better off than a sergeant's partner of same sex? Why would that be the case, Senator Murray? Because you want to satisfy your emotional commitment on a case-by-case -case basis. What the government is saying is we need to analyse each section of the community. And I'll go further so you understand what the problems are here. Order of order, Senator Murray. Uh, the minister is misleading the Senate, and I would appreciate it if uh, that matter was addressed by him. Uh, perhaps he doesn't realise that this very day we moved an amendment exactly of this kind Sorry, to Senator the Defence Force Retirement and Ben Death Benefits Act. So Sir, we didn't leave out the sergeants, and he's misleading the, the Senate. Unfortunately, Senator Murray, there's no point of order. There's no point of order. Of course, there isn't, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. And so, and so. Um, let's let's look at it from the perspective of the fact that we're talking about superannuation. Now, there's no same-sex marriage in Australia. I hope Senator Murray would agree with that. We have a common law relationship or we have a partnership formed in the civil law. Oh, and of course, Senator Murray, Senator Murray doesn't want to understand what I'm talking about because these are deep legal principles that you don't just go writing checks off at a whim, an emotional whim. Now, let's talk about this. These relationships actually produce children, and Senator Murray might be surprised to know that they could be categorised as dependents. They could be the subject of the sort of amendments he's talking about, not just Justice Kirby's partner, but children who are dependent. And you bring in a whole host of, and, and I love it when Senator George Campbell says, "So what? The rights of the child, Senator Campbell. The rights of the child. A United Nations Convention that you obviously don't even know about. You don't even know about." You just disclose absolute gross ignorance for someone who served so long in this place. Now let's talk about let's talk about human rights and equity flowing from this. Here we have a group of a group of senators who want to start writing checks, bill by bill, case by case. What I'm talking about is having an overall well-considered policy that deals with this inequity. Now, to do it one at a time, case by case, and write the sort of checks that Senator Murray and obviously Senator Lugg would, would have us write, is to discriminate those who are not the beneficiaries of this bill. Is to discriminate. So two wrongs will make a right. 
This is, what, this is what the learned senators are saying on the cross benches. Two wrongs will make a right. I want to just introduce the ingredient of family law, property settlements. Now, Senator Murray hasn't even thought about that because superannuation will be the subject. That's right. The states have to reference the power, and you need to be married. Now, of course, these are things that the Labor Party would make up as it goes along. Make up as it goes along in an emotive, unconsidered, uh, unthought out, half baked, uh, half, half uh, understood way. So that we have a whole host of legal principles that need to be considered if we're going to do the job properly. That's the fundamental issue. And of course, these are things that when you pander to, to sectional interests without actually considering good government, Mr Acting Deputy President, you end up making errors. And indeed, I shouldn't have to stand here, and I'm a bit uh, embarrassed that I do have to mention these things to you Senator Murray. Be embarrassed. Now, superannuation is a fundamental ingredient of day-to-day -day life in Australia, and the beneficiaries of that are the essence of what we need to explore on a on a, an agency by agency, employee by employee basis, so that we get the actuarial, the actuarial mix correct, so that we achieve an equitable assessment of how same-sex relationships are going to be resolved in a way that is transparent and fair across all agencies. Now, all agencies are different, and that is the essence of a case-by-case -case consideration. Now, having said that, in conclusion, Judges are entitled to receive the benefit of the lower maximum rates of surcharge through this bill, which apply to other high income earners in 2003, 2004 and 2004, 2005. Since other Commonwealth defined benefit schemes already offer their members a, co a commutation opinion, this is simply to bring judges, the judges' scheme into line. The Judges' Pension Amendment Bill will address judges' concerns about the application of the surcharge. It will give the benefit of the lower maximum rates and the flexibility to make partial payments of their surcharge debts before they retire. The additional entitlements provided to federal magistrates under the Federal Magistrates' Disability and Death Benefits Bill will assist to ensure both the continued high calibre of appointees and that federal magistrates can focus on their important duties without being distracted by concerns over the adequacy of protection available to them and their dependents and their dependents in, this, in the sad event of disability or death. And I commend these bills to the Senate. The question is that the bills now be read a second time. All of that opinion, please say aye. aye. Against, say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Judges' Pensions Amendment Bill 2007, Federal Magistrates Amendment Disability and Death Benefits Bill 2007. <coughs> Is it the wish of the committee that the Judges' Pensions Amendment Bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is, Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. I move uh, amendment uh, or item number one and two uh, by leave uh, together. Uh, three I'll need to deal with separately. It's a, an unrelated matter, if I may. Is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. Uh, thank you. The, the debate has, I think, already uh, mostly taken place during the, uh, the second reading debate, so I won't extend it uh, any longer than uh, need be, given the lateness of the hour. Clearly, this item inserts a new definition of de facto relationship into the Act. The definition is based on the recommendations of the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Model definition published in its report. It goes on, of course, to define a de facto couple as a couple living together in a genuine domestic relationship and then provides a list of uh, A to J of, those, uh, of, the, uh, of how that would then be taken into account. It, uh, does not, uh, it does confine itself and it is narrowly cast. It's, uh, in fact, more narrowly cast than the amendments by the other minor parties, but be that as it may, uh, it does seek uh, equity, as I indicated in the second reading speech for uh, Justice Kirby. The prime, this of course is the prime amendment that Labor is moving to the Act, and the rest are uh, consequential. 
the effect will be that the de facto homosexual couples will gain access to the same rights as de facto heterosexual couples, which is the uh, main import. And as we know, it only relates, of course, to the particular uh, act which it amends, which is the Judges' Pension Amendment Bill. So while, uh, while Minister Johnson uh, was keen to spray me with uh, the minor parties, uh, sometimes I don't mind standing <coughs> with you, but in this instance I'm slightly, slightly apart. There is a, this is only in respect of the Judges' Pension Amendment Bill 2007, and it seeks, uh, which it seeks to amend that act to provide for okay. equity in respect of the arguments that were progressed during the second reading speech and I've outlined uh, now. And uh, I commend that to the Senate. Thank you. The question is that uh, amendments one and two moved by Senator Ludwig be agreed to. All of that opinion, please say aye. Against say no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Ludwig, would you like to move uh, your amendment number three? I would. Thank you very much. I'm disappointed that the government uh, doesn't take the opportunity in this instance to move uh, what I consider a, uh, and really going from what they've said in the past, the opportunity to take a case by case example with a, uh, what is a narrow amendment to a, uh, which doesn't have the cost implications that. Uh, Senator Johnson averse to, and of course, uh, it can, if he talks about a range of other uh, Commonwealth officers, sergeants, officers, for that matter. I didn't want to uh, leave out the ordinary, um, and in fact, the exceptional sometimes uh, foot soldiers. And but the government can undertake that process. They can demonstrate their bona fides in this and uh, undertake their work. But in this instance, they can, of course, start with this one first. But in respect of the item number three, uh, I move uh, that way. The final item is to remove the term child of a marital relationship from the Act. The term, in fact, came to our attention when we were preparing our amendments for this bill. It appears to be a hanger on, possibly from a previous amendment to the legislation that has been missed. Sometimes I spend uh, most of my time uh, looking at your legislation and these things turn up occasionally and I give you the opportunity of correcting it. The problem with the definition is that it appears only once in the legislation. It appears only in the definition section. So you have uh, a phrase that is defined but in fact not used. Uh, not unusual, I guess, for Commonwealth legislation, but it occasionally comes up. In my view, this appears to be a redundant section of the legislation. The term child and eligible child are defined elsewhere, and those are the terms that are used throughout the Act. I'd be happy to accept advice uh, from the uh, minister as to whether or not this is uh, worthwhile keeping in the definition, however, as it does not appear to, be, uh, to have any uh, function as it's unrelated to any other section. And it does appear that in keeping uh, with uh, always removing causes for confusion, it might be worthwhile accepting this amendment and removing it unless there's good cause to keep it. And unless, of course, uh, the uh, minister has some clarification as to uh, whether or not uh, there's a good reason for keeping it there. The question is, Minister. Thank you, Chair. I have no clarification there. But what I want to say about uh, um, the, the broad thrust of my response to the same-sex amendment is that whilst Senator Ludwig uh, wants to tell us that the states have referred uh, matters of superannuation from de facto relationships to the Commonwealth, I want to point out, uh, in terms of underlining my position, that of course South Australia and Western Australia have not done that. So what do you say, Senator Ludwig? What do you say about that? Because what that underlines is what I'm saying. We need a proper detailed, well thought out, comprehensive plan to deal with this issue, not make it up as we go along. The question is that amendment number th order, order. The question is that amendment number three moved by Senator Ludwig uh, be agreed to. 
All of that opinion, please say aye. Against, say no. I think the noes have it. Right. Sen Senator Murray. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. I seek leave to move. Uh, oh, order. I, I Order, please. There's uh, too much noise in the chamber, Senator Ludwig. Uh, Senator Murray. Thank you, sir. I seek uh, leave to move items one to five on sheet 5325, revised two together. Is, is leave granted? Uh, Senator Murray, I'm advised that on the running sheet uh, it's one to seven. So oh, sorry, uh, my apologies. There's yep. a mistake on the running sheet, and yep. it should be yep. uh, one to seven. Is that, that is, uh, your that understanding? That is quite right. That, is that's leave on the revised two? Leave is sought. Is leave granted? Leave. No objection. Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator uh, Murray. Uh, I propose to move the same amendment that Senator Ludwig voted for. Um, uh, as you heard, he, mm. he said he was a little bit uh, distant from us uh, on this matter. He actually voted for it, and if you look carefully, you'll see it was in a division. Uh, and the division related to the same amendment which was designed to the Income Tax Assessment Act 1936 and 1997, which was moved uh, earlier this, this week, and there was a division on it, uh, and uh, it uh, had Labor Democrats uh, Greens versus Family First and the Liberal and National Party. So that, that's how that vote went. So when you hear uh, Senator Ludwig say he's uh, slightly apart from us, perhaps it is with respect to this bill. It certainly wasn't respect to the Income Tax Act because he voted for it. Uh, this week uh, we have dealt with this uh, in a systematic basis. I, would, uh, I, I don't intend to engage um, uh, through you, Chair, the Minister, in, in his rebuttal of my position. I could continue rebutting his and we can go backwards and forwards uh, and I suspect he will use his barrister skills and I will use my, and I will use my deep understanding of superannuation uh, of financial figures, uh, but uh, it's best left alone probably at this, at this time of night, at this time. Of week, but I would indicate, uh, just just for the assistance of the chamber, uh, that this week uh, these amendments have been re rejected by uh, the coalition with respect to the Defence Force Retirement and Death Benefits Act, 1973. Uh, they'll be rejecting it to the Federal Magistrates Amendment uh, Act, uh, Disabilities and uh, Death Benefits uh, Act. I'm sure. Um, they rejected it with respect to the Health Insurance Act 1973, to the Income Tax Assessment Act 1936 and 1997. Uh, they will, uh, they've indicated they'll reject these to the Judges' Pensions Act and the Judicial and Statutory Officers Remuneration and Allowances Act. Um, they rejected it with respect to the Parliamentary Contributory Superannuation Act and the Parliamentary Entitlements Act 1990. They uh, rejected it uh, with respect to uh, the uh, Social um, Security Act 1991. They rejected it with respect to the Superannuation uh, uh, Act 1976 and 1990 and 1993. Uh, and they rejected it with respect to the Workplace Relations Act 1996. So that totals 12. Um, so these are hardly um, an attempt to leave out sergeants and include judges, which I I thought right. uh, the minister might have thought because he might not have been paying attention to other um, to other legislation. He has a busy life as as, as a minister, uh, and I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. But we have made a systematic, holistic, comprehensive approach uh, to this matter. Uh, I've said, Mr. Chairman, I won't engage further in debate, uh, and I won't unless provoked. I'll simply move uh, my amendments. Thank you. The question is, Minister. Look, thank you, Chair. I, I certainly don't want to provoke Senator Murray because I know he's earnest and sincere and I respect him enormously. <laughs> sorry, sorry. The, the, point, the point I want to make is that the government is not saying no. The government is not saying no. The government has said we are considering this and I want to just pause to say that this is a very very significant legislation, generational legislation, Senator Murray, through you, Chair. Now, 
if we go down this path and, uh, and as time rolls by, it seems that we are going to go down that path and the attorney's words ring in my ear that the government is considering this. Your amendment, can I say, is interesting, but I think it, it sets out, by way of example, the sorts of problems we're dealing with. As you well know, we have six states and two territories. They make legislation. They have, by and large, all of them enacted de facto legislation. The defining, the defining point of de facto legislation is the affluxion of time. In other words, de facto, de facto spouses acquire rights by virtue of the duration of the relationship. Now, what your amendments seek to do, and indeed a number of amendments before this chamber have sought to do, is to say that rights are acquired, particularly, firstly, let's deal with children. A child born of a de facto relationship or a child adopted by the persons engaged in that relationship during the period of the relationship. Period, there's a period mentioned there. You then go on to define De facto relationship means a relationship between two people living together as a couple on a genuine domestic basis. Now, you then clarify that to say not married. Given that the states define de facto relationship by virtue of time and you haven't, you have created a complete conundrum between rights that flow by virtue of state legislation and rights that we would seek to bestow by virtue of Commonwealth legislation. This creates a dual rights regime, the haves and the have-nots. Now, All I'm saying to you is please work this through. It is complex. There is a host of considerations and we are giving them consideration. Now, It's not going to happen tonight. It's not going to happen in the immediate term, but ultimately I think the package will go across agencies, across departments. We'll look at actuarial tables, we'll look at life expectancies of same-sex couples, we'll look at the effect on children and take the states with us. And that's all I'm saying to you. Please go with us on this, on this mission. The question is that the amendments... Uh, Senator Ludwig. It just dawned on me too, I think you were wrong about that uh, WA, because WA have their own family court. And if I'm not, and if I'm not correct, they can do... Yes. yes. But they then can deal with same-sex defect couples as well in their system. But anyway, I, I, it, it's a minor argument. We can. Whoops! It's ten to ten. They tell me from behind, and so uh, we shouldn't have that debate now. But it's it's it's. Uh, I'll turn to Senator Murray's amendment. The uh, Senator Murray, I, I actually prefer my amendment. I'm going to uh, not support yours. The amendments uh, that uh, the Democrats is designed to accomplish largely the same task as ours, although they differ in detail. Specifically, the definition they use of de facto relationship is similar to the model in the uh, human rights and equal opportunity definition, but it's worded in a slightly different manner. A recommendation, recommended subsection 3 has been included with the 2, uh, subsection 2. In addition, the Democrat amendment does not include the optional uh, human rights and equal opportunity clause, which gives recognition to relationship registered under a state scheme, uh, whereas our amendments make this inclusion. Uh, we already understand that uh, Tasmania has a, a state registered uh, relationship uh, register. And as such, I, my Labor's view is that the amendments will offer uh, our amendment, uh, although defeated, will offer greater certainty to the couples who have a de facto uh, relationship registered under this scheme. There are two more areas of distinction as well between our amendments and the Democrat amendments. Uh, the Democrat amendments include a new definition of child of a de facto relationship, which parallels the definition of child of a marital relationship which already exists. Uh, I'm not convinced that this is, this is a necessary. If you look through the Act, the only time the term child of a marital relationship is used in the definitions, it does not appear to be anywhere else in the Act, and the term child of a de facto uh, relationship uh, will not be either, but I offered that up to the government, but uh, it failed to amend it. Maybe you could look at it some other time now, given that it's passed. The definition of child in section 4 already includes adopted children and biological children under the age of 16. If a child is validly adopted under the law of an Australian state, it is uh, fair to assume they will fall under this Act. 
In addition, the Act sets up a scheme for determining whether or not a child can receive pensions under section 4AA and 9 to 12. That section provides that a child is eligible to receive part of pension if the child is a child of a deceased judge. Uh, and if, to quote B, the Attorney General is of the opinion that at the time of the death of the deceased judge, the child was wholly or substantially dependent on the deceased judge or Roman numeral two, but for the death of the deceased judge, the child would have been wholly or substantially dependent on the deceased judge. Sections 9 through to 12 set up when an eligible child may receive a pension. Uh, Labor's uh, uh, amendments uh, would have uh, removed the definition of child of marital relationship entirely, and as such, although I support the general concerns raised uh, by you, Senator Murray, uh, they are uh, echoed in the Labor's. Uh, they are echoed, of course, uh, by Labor, but uh, we won't uh, be supporting them for the fact. Uh, the amendments combined would seem to have the combined effect of removing one of the redundant definitions and replacing it with another, unfortunately, in, in my view, although I don't mean to be harsh in saying that. I would uh, seek clarification from the government on why this definition may be in the Act. They can have another go if they want to tell us when I move, uh, which uh, when I then tried uh, in, in vainly, uh, vainly it seems, to explain that to uh, Minister Johnson, but uh, maybe they could have another go now. Finally, the Democrats have restructured the legislation to replace every instance of the term marital relationship and replace it with the term beneficiary relationship. Uh, on balance, uh, I prefer to stay with the draft uh, that Labor has put forward. We've spent a bit of time uh, doing that. We think that it matches here we are, it matches the position that Labor has adopted in respect of the state-based relationship register and offers uh, greater certainty to uh, those same-sex de facto couples who have registered the relationship under a state scheme such as in uh, Tasmania. So on those, uh, on those uh, words I'd uh, uh, unfortunately not uh, find ourselves being able to support uh, your amendment. The question uh, Senator Murray. Uh, I would just say so that uh, people uh, participating in the debate do understand uh, that I took very senior and very specialised advice in designing the amendment. Uh, it, this isn't uh, one of those things you knock on, off on the back of a uh, cigarette um, um, box. And I would say to just to the government, perhaps when you're considering matters, you might look at uh, some of the concepts which have been fed to me to try and resolve uh, what the minister has properly identified as thorny issues in which uh, the shadow attorney general has indicated uh, uh, need some, some thought. Uh, so uh, the, these do come. These do come with a, a fairly uh, good pedigree in, the, in their design. Um, so that is uh, all I will say to that. The question is, yes, Senator Nettle. Thank you. I just want to indicate in the same way that the Greens supported the previous amendments by the opposition, we're supporting these amendments by the Australian Democrats. Thank you. The question is that uh, amendments one to seven on sheet 5325 moved by Senator Murray be agreed to. All of that opinion, please say aye. Against say no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Nettle. I will now seek leave to move Australian Greens amendments one to five on sheet 5335 together. Is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. Senator Nettle. Uh, thank you. These set of amendments go to the same issue that the previous two sets of amendments went to, and that is to remove the discrimination that exists within this legislation. Um, the Australian Greens amendments do it um, comprehensively. Um, and I feel like there's almost like not much more that you can say to this. We don't support discrimination. <laughs> and so these amendments seek to remove that discrimination right across the board. Um, this is an opportunity presented um, to move such amendments. Um, Senator Murray's talked about the other opportunities we've had this week to remove that discrimination, and Greens have been supportive of, of those, those attempts to remove the discrimination. 
we don't we don't believe in discrimination, so we seek to remove it from the law, and, and that's what these amendments do. Thank you, Senator Nettle. The question, uh, Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you. Uh, in terms of contributing to the debate in the committee stage, uh, I will take uh, Senator Murray's advice uh, about. I will also have another look at those amendments that you've drafted uh, as well. Uh, I tried not to uh, make my words seem too unkind, uh, but nevertheless, sometimes they might come out that way this evening. Senator Nettle might find these words a little unkind, unfortunately. No, let's hope Senator Nettle isn't either. The, uh, we're not prepared to uh, support uh, Senator Nettle's amendments. In fact, I'd use the language I'd oppose them. It is surprising uh, to me, although it may have been an oversight, but I don't know. Uh, I'm sure Senator Nettle may wish to clarify. But they don't extend the benefits to same-sex couples. The reason they don't, in fact, do that uh, in Labor's view is there is no specific inclusion of same-sex partners in the proposed amendments as there are in the Labor and Democrat amendments. This, in our view, uh, does not offer sufficient coverage for same-sex de facto partners and sufficient certainty, certainty that they are in fact covered. The federal law hasn't defined uh, a de facto relationship to include same-sex couples. The Family Law Act, for instance, defines a de facto relationship as a de facto relationship means a relationship between a man and a woman who live with each other as spouses on a genuine domestic basis, although not legally married to each other. The dictionary definition of de facto means basically in fact or in reality. Given that the Marriage Act specifically excludes marriage or same-sex partners, it's hard to see how a same-sex relationship could be construed as a de facto unless it was more specifically defined. Uh, what that uh, means is that if you look at the previous case law on this, Brown and the Commissioner for Superannuation in 1995 examined a similar issue. In that case, the question was whether or not the phrase ordinarily lived with that other person as that other person's husband or wife on a permanent and bona fide domestic basis, whether that could in fact include same-sex couples. It was not ultimately decided that it did not. Although there are obvious uh, marked differences between Brown and the present situation with the Green Amendment, it does show that, at least in that instance, Australian courts have been hesitant as to whether or not to accept same-sex relationships as de facto couples. You would have to then go through that process to then see if, in fact, it was, whereas in respect of both the Democrat and the Labor, you do not expose yourself to a court case for the determination of that fact. The amendment proposed by Labor and indeed by the Democrats make it clear that the same-sex couples are covered under the pension scheme. The amendments proposed by the Greens do not. Uh, this, is, this is an example where I can see where the Greens try to achieve something, but you can't actually trust the Greens to actually do something constructive. I do accept that on many occasions your principles uh, might then uh, push you, but it does seem that you harp about these things but actually fail, fail to actually get it right. The Green Amendment would not, it seems to me, extend benefits to same-sex de facto couples. Instead, they would slightly extend the existing scheme and create two parallel schemes for de facto relationships, and on that basis Labor opposes the Green Amendment. The question is that the amendments moved by Senator Nettle 1 to 5 on sheet 5335 be agreed to. All of that opinion, please say aye. Against say no. I think the noes have it. The question now is that the bill stand is printed. All of that opinion, please say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. We'll now move to the Federal Magistrates Amendment Disability and Death Benefits Bill. And Senator Stott Despoyer. Thank you, Chair. I seek leave to move amendments one and two in my name. Uh, Senator on Scott Despoir, just before you oh, do, sorry. I need to ask the question if it's the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole. Uh, if there be no objection, uh, it's so ordered. Uh, Senator Scott Despoir. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, here am I wanting to sp speed it up a little. Um, uh, I seek leave uh, to move amendments one and two. Uh, in relation to the reduction of age threshold for benefits, uh, standing in my name, 
On behalf of the Australian Democrats, uh, Section 6 of the Judges' Pensions Act 1968 sets the age threshold for judges for, of every other federal court at 60 years, yet the age threshold for benefits and death benefits under this bill has been set at 65 uh, in the submission to the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee. And that seems an awful long time ago now through you, Chair. I think it was beginning of last year, April last year, that took place. But the Victorian Bar noted that this bill continues to place federal magistrates on an unequal footing with judges of every other federal court by not including federal magistrates under the Judges' Pensions Act 1968. So we propose that the age threshold for benefits should be reduced to 60, which would place federal magistrates on equal footing with judges of every other federal court whose pensions are determined by the Judges' Pensions Act 1968. Uh, we believe this is an opportunity to be fair to federal magistrates. We believe the reduction of the age threshold for benefits to 60 years would serve to ensure relativity of remuneration within the federal judicial system. Uh, I could go on, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, I, first of all, can. Uh, Probably read the uh, the, uh, the numbers in this place, and uh, similarly, chair, uh, when I move uh, um, other amendments in relation to this legislation, I'll try and expedite that process as well. Thank you. The question is that uh, amendments one and two on sheet five two six zero, moved by Senator Stott to Spoyer, be agreed to. All of that opinion, please say aye. All of those, all of. Uh, all against say no. I think the noes have it. Senator Stottis, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. That really did expedite proceedings. Uh, I might seek leave in that case to move Democrat amendments three to six in my name on uh, sheet five two six zero. Uh, the um, you I'm don't, assuming you leave don't, is you don't seek. You don't need leave, Senator Stottis. To move them you. together. Okay. I won't need to do that. Oh, I am advised you do. That's you, is okay. leave granted. No objection, Lee. Thank you, Chair. I know it's late, but I thought I had to do that. Uh, look, uh, Chair, the, uh, the Senate will be aware that this is uh, a related issue. It relates to uh, same-sex uh, entitlements. I think the debate that we've had here uh, today, um, we've probably um, um, had, uh, had the debate um, to a sufficient degree. Um, obviously, uh, the Democrats uh, put on record uh, our disappointment at the outcome of the last set of amendments without wanting to reflect on a, um, a vote of the chamber, of course. This is uh, an attempt to amend the legislation before us in relation to dealing with same-sex uh, issues, and uh, we've sought to do that um, by, uh, by changing uh, uh, words such as uh, husband and wife, so those relevant definitions to um, that terminology to, to partner. Um, I think that uh, the arguments have been put forward uh, uh, by colleagues uh, on this side, and I urge the Senate um, to support the amendments uh, before it. Thank you. The question is that uh, amendments three through to six on sheet five two six zero, moved by Senator Stott Spoyer, be agreed to. All of that opinion, please say aye. Against say no. I think, I think the noes have it. The question is that the bill stand is printed. Those of that yeah. Senator Stott to spoil it. Thank you, Chair. I don't want to move a division for a division on that particular vote, and I'm wondering, and I know it's a courtesy only if uh, senators will indicate how their parties voted, so I don't have to um, take up time with a division, please. Senator Ludwig. I'm happy to indicate the position. It was the similar to what I've been adopting all night in respect of these types of amendments from the Democrats in this area. We agree with the principle. We've said it uh, repeatedly during this evening about this, in this debate. In respect of uh, this particular one, we prefer our position, quite frankly, and, and then uh, willing to continue to, even though the government won't accept it, uh, we think we might be able to wear them down eventually. Uh, Minister? Uh, the government, it may be of no surprise to anybody who's voting against the amendment. Thank you. Senator Nettle? Thank you, Senator Nettle. The question now is that the bill stand as printed. All of that opinion, please say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. Senator Stott Despoy, are you seeking the call? <laughs> Very good. The question now is that the bill, the bills with, a, with an S be reported. Those of that opinion, please say aye. Again, say no. I think the ayes have it. 
The uh, committee has considered the Judges' Pensions Amendment Bill 2007 and the Federal Magistrates Amendment Disability and Death Benefits Bill 2007 and agreed to them without amendments. Minister. I move the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Parl uh, Minister. Mr. Deputy President, I move the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. Those that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Charges Pensions Amendment Bill 2007, Federal Magistrates Amendment Disability and Death Benefits Bill 2007. Messages have been received from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Defence Legislation Amendment Bill 2007, Crimes Legislation Amendment Child Sex Tourism Offences and Related Measures Bill 2007. Minister. Uh, Mr Deputy President, these bills are being introduced together. After debate on the motion for the second reading has been adjourned, I shall move a motion to have the bills listed separately on the notice paper. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is the bills be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Defence Legislation Amendment Bill 2007, Crimes Legislation Amendment Child Sex Tourism Offences and Related Measures Bill 2007. The Minister. Mr Deputy President, uh, I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the Defence Legislation Amendment Bill 2007 and move that these bills be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of these bills is now adjourned till the first day of the next period of sittings. The Minister. Uh, Mr Deputy President, I move that the bills be listed on the notice paper as separate orders of the day. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Um, messages have been received from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has a agreed to the Australian Crime Commission Amendment Bill 2007 and the National Health Amendment Pharmaceutical Benefits Bill 2007 without amendment and b agreed to the amendment made by the Senate to the Tax Laws Amendment 2007 Measures No. 5 Bill 2007. A message has been received from the House of Representatives forwarding the Veterans Entitlements Amendment Disability War Widow and War Widower Pensioners Bill 2007 for concurrence. The Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the bill be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Veterans Entitlements Act 1986 and for related purposes. The Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to exempt this bill from the bill's cut-off order. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. The Minister. Mr Deputy President, I move that the provisions of paragraphs 5 to 8 uh, of Standing Order 111 not apply to this bill, allowing it to be considered dur during this period of sittings. Table a statement of reasons justifying the need for this bill to be considered during these sittings and I seek leave to have the statement incorporated in Hansard. Leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. The Minister. I move that this bill be now read a, a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Um, Senator Ludwig. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I seek leave to incorporate uh, my speech in response respect of the Veterans Entitlements Amendment Disability War Widows and War Widows Pension Bill 2007. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Clark. The question is now that the bill be read a second time. Senator Bartlett. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I don't have a speech to incorporate. I will have to actually use the old-fashioned verbal communication technique. Um, this is a piece of legislation which has uh, appeared extremely rapidly, um, even by this government's standards. Uh, I think it appeared only today in the House of Reps and uh, already here tonight and passed tonight. So uh, 
a true uh, one-day wonder. Uh, fortunately, it's a, a positive piece of legislation rather than a, a negative one, like some of the others that have been rushed through this place in recent times. But it, it does make the point that uh, when the government does want to move on something, uh, they can do it pretty quickly, uh, which is very relevant um, to the issue that I will raise further on in my amendment in the committee stage, but also to the issue we've been debating a number of times today, including just on the last bill, uh, where the government's kept saying they need to further examine the issue in regard to uh, removing discrimination in a whole range of acts. And, uh, as senators would know, 1995 was when the Democrats first put forward proposals to address that in a comprehensive way. Twelve years later, and uh, government's still considering it. But uh, this piece of legislation reflects a uh, government's commitment um, to uh, increase payments to disability pensioners and war widows and war widow pensioners. It's disability um, veterans pensioners, uh, as well as changing the methodology using to, used to index their pensions. Uh, this is in response to quite a recent announcement by the federal government and uh, again shows that uh, when the political will is there, uh, the movement can be quite quick because it's, it's a not inexpensive measure. The total cost to it over four and a bit years is $470 million. So it's, it's, uh, it's not, um, not going to break the bank, particularly at the moment, but it's uh, you know, not uh, loose change either. Uh, and again, it shows that uh, when the political will is there or when the political need is perceived to be there on the even of an election, uh, then uh, things can move very quickly from the government's point of view, including introducing legislation in, in what is a relatively complex area, dealing with uh, the indexation formulas for uh, veterans' disability pensioners and more widows and widower pensioners. Uh, it's actually quite a, quite a messy area. And, uh, I know that from having tried to move amendments dealing specifically with indexation of various veterans' payments in the past. Uh, so good to see things can move fast. Uh, hard not to be a little bit cynical about uh, the selective application of the promptness principle. Uh, however, uh, I don't think it really matters about uh, the motivation. It's a positive result for uh, many in the veterans' community and therefore it should be welcomed and is welcomed by the Democrats. Uh, it does provide a one-off increase of $15 per fortnight to the extreme disablement adjustment rate, a 5 per cent increase to the general rate, and a change to the methodology used to index the general rate pension for veterans, all with effect from uh, the March 2008 adjust adjustment. It also allows a one-off increase of $10 per fortnight to the former domestic allowance component of war widows and war widows pensions, uh, which, as I understand it, uh, hasn't been increased for quite some time. Uh, so it does go a fair way towards restoring the original value of that particular allowance. Uh, this one-off increase to the extreme disablement uh, adjustment rate brings it into line with increases to the special rate and intermediate rate disability pensions. Uh, and it also provides that 5 per cent increase to general rate disability pensions, which will mean a fortnightly increase of $20 for all pensioners at or above the general rate. Uh, the, there's been a little bit of um, competition in this area between the government and the opposition in recent times, and uh, that's something that the Democrats welcome, and uh, I'd say it's certainly something that most in the veterans community welcome as well. Uh, it's been a lot of agitation by a lot of groups for a long period of time, uh, and it is uh, almost a bit like uh, the opposition put forward their proposals and pledges. Uh, the government matched them and uh, up the ante, and the opposition immediately matched, matched them back again. Uh, now, either way, it, it produces better results for the veterans community, and, and at least in this case, I think it's produced a good policy outcome because it's not like what occasionally happens in a pre-election environment where the bidding war breaks out, uh, where you'll get uh, quite poor public policy outcomes with just uh, grabbing a, a vote-buying opportunity. Uh, these initiatives that are being put forward are based upon uh, specific issues that have been agitated for for a long period of time. Uh, and quite valid concerns expressed by uh, many in the veterans community. So it is actually uh, simply matching a valid claim, valid concerns uh, that have been put forward uh, over a long period. Uh, and it is, I think, more so than congratulating the government and uh, before that the opposition for their actions in this regard. I think first and foremost it's actually uh, congratulations to the uh, ex-service organisations in all of their uh, forms and sizes and styles uh, for their work 
in pushing this, these issues so hard for so long uh, in the face of such resistance. Uh, the immense contribution of so many organisations, uh, many of them voluntary organisations or predominantly voluntary organisations, community-based organisations, uh, advocating on behalf of uh, many different segments of the veterans community uh, is something that is, is quite impressive, their level of commitment, their, their passion for the issue um, and for their own uh, groups and their own constituents, if you like, is, is very admirable and uh, you know, bills like this should be ones they should chalk up as, as clear achievements um, to, uh, you know, to really indicate that they are making a difference. Now, having said all of that, uh, it is still appropriate to indicate that there's uh, further areas that do need to be addressed. Um, there are other issues in regard to appropriate indexation of, of superannuation uh, for veterans. Um, there's also uh, issues to do with uh, taxation and treatment of taxation of, of military superannuation. Um, and there is, of course, the issue of the ongoing discrimination in regards to um, uh, people with same-sex partners, which I'll address in the committee stage of the debate. Uh, the other point that I do want to take the opportunity to make once again uh, is that while these changes that address some entitlements to war widows and war, war widowers um, and uh, people on the uh, veterans on the extreme disablement adjustment rate, uh, there is. I, I really do need to continually take the opportunity to emphasise my ongoing concern about the need to still further improve the support we provide to other ex-service personnel who are uh, who have uh, disabilities or health. Uh, problems as a direct consequence of their service in the armed forces who do who who have not received that um, health problem or health uh, issue as a result of uh, warlike service but from other activities within the defense force uh, there is a quite a clear distinction between the types of support that's provided to, to people uh, depending on whether or not their um, disability uh, or health issue has arisen uh, as a consequence of warlike service or other activities, and uh, I think that's a real ongoing problem, not just for the individuals concerned and their families, but for the Australian community, because I, I have absolutely no doubt it directly affects the ability um, of the Defence Force to recruit people, and even more so the ability of the Defence Force to retain people. Uh, I met uh, someone just yesterday, a 30-year-old woman, who was, uh, as a 20-year-old in the Navy, injured quite severely with a, uh, a severe neck and back injury. Her initial treatment was nothing short of absolutely appalling and disgraceful, uh, and the inability to properly uh, assess her injury uh, at that early stage uh, and the long delay in properly assessing that injury seriously compromised her long-term health and uh, her ongoing uh, quality of life. Uh, and when you're fit and active and vital, as most people are when they're uh, 20 or so years old and joining the, the Navy or any of the um, Defence Forces, uh, to suddenly go from that to being uh, severely uh, incapacitated as a result of um, injury directly caused by your service uh, and to find that you're not getting the support uh, both initially and uh, longer term, not getting uh, the support, having to, to scratch and fight and battle uh, to get assistance with your medical treatment. Uh, it's not only a, an absolute travesty and injustice for the individual, uh, it, it really does send a very strong message to so many people around them that uh, it's a pretty bad idea joining, uh, joining the ADF because uh, if you get injured you're not always guaranteed you're going to get well looked after. Now, there have been improvements in recent times and I fully accept that, uh, but uh, I see it as part of my task and the Democrats' task to keep that pressure on uh, to improve things up to a, a consistently high standard for all uh, injured and wounded ex-service um, personnel, regardless of where uh, their injury occurred or how their uh, health conditions were generated, uh, if it's related at all to their being part of our defence um, force, if it's related at all to their decision to join uh, the Defence Forces and serve their country, then they should get that sort of support uh, and uh, in an ongoing and reliable way. Uh, the extra stress people get 
people endure from having to battle uh, purely to get support can often be just as debilitating. And that feeling of abandonment, uh, that feeling of the, the, the mental stress of having to fight for your entitlements, and also the, the wider stress that pushes across onto the family as a whole. Uh, and that is a consistent picture I see as well, because the burden falls back on the family, as it does with carers in all sorts of areas in the community. Uh, but so you see that stress and trauma and compromising of quality of life spreading out from the individual to the wider family. So I know that goes wider than what's in the bill before us now, but I, I really want to take the opportunity to repeat that message at every opportunity, because it is, it is still something we are falling short on, and we do need to lift our game uh, much further. And I do hope uh, in this pre-election environment that there is uh, genuine acknowledgement given to that issue by both major parties and uh, a specific focus on the need of injured um, service personnel uh, across the board because we do need to lift our game. Uh, coming back to the um, specifics within the legislation, they are welcome as far as they go. Uh, there are still wider issues in regard to indexation of superannuation in particular uh, and ensuring that, uh, as well as taxation treatment, and that they need to continue to be pushed for. Uh, there are wider parts, as I understand it, of the uh, policy commitments of both the government and the opposition that still do need to be implemented in legislation. Uh, the fact that this part of it has been able to be brought forward and put in place so quickly is welcome, um, but again it does uh, beg the question uh, of why it couldn't have been done sooner, and it also begs the question about uh, uh, why it uh, can take so long to do something sometimes, even when the government says they fully support it in principle. Uh, there can be years in the making, and yet when there's a, a sudden need to gain or regain or try to regain support on an issue, then uh, the movement can be um, rapid in the extreme. But having said that, it's a positive piece of legislation. I, I would only make the single cautionary remark, uh, as I said at the start, uh, the formulas and uh, different components of uh, allowances and pensions and entitlements uh, in the veterans area is quite messy and complicated. Um, I'm not in any way disputing the drafting skills of the, the government, but the, there is that issue when you rush through legislation this quickly in this area uh, of whether or not you get it right. Uh, I'm sure if they don't get it right, then um, these don't come into force, as I understand it, until March next year. So there'll be opportunity to fix it up down the track. But it's, it, it does need to be said that whilst the legislation um, is positive, assuming it does what the government says it does, then uh, um, there is still that, that issue of uh, the risk of implementing legislative changes like this in such a rapid form of making sure we have actually got it right and it does do what we think it does. But uh, I think it does what uh, the government thinks it does, and assuming it does what they think it does, then uh, it's a good thing, so we support it. Thank you, Senator Bartlett. Minister. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, this is a bill which delivers great benefits to war widows and war widowers. I commend the bill to the Senate and thank uh, senators for their contribution. Uh, thank you, Minister. The question is that the second reading be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Veterans Entitlements Act 1986 and for related purposes. Is it the uh, wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is, is Senator Bartlett. Thank you, um, Chair. I move the amendment circulated in my name. On Are you seeking leave to move one to five together? I think I shall. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Bartlett. Thank you. That's the amendments on sheet 5404 revised. Look, uh, these amendments, as people can see, is uh, also amendments to address the existing discrimination in the Veterans uh, Entitlements Act uh, in regards to people with same sex partners. Uh, it uh, redefines the definition of de facto partner and de facto relationship to include people in uh, same sex relationships as well as opposite sex relationships. It is, of course, an issue the Democrats have put forward in amendments uh, many, many, many times over the years, uh, and we have done it quite a number of times just in this week, 
uh, and indeed I think about four or five times just today. So I won't go through the arguments in great detail. We've just had um, one of those arguments in regard to the uh, previous piece of legislation to do with uh, judges. But uh, I, I do believe I have to, um, partly because of the uh, contribution of the minister in the previous debate to the amendments the Democrat moved in relation to judges' pensions, where he's quite explicitly said, well, if you give uh, remove this discrimination against judges and give judges uh, with same-sex partners access to the pension, then you know, what are you going to do about defence forces, people with uh, people in the veterans community, to use an example, an explicit example that he gave? Well, this is what we do about it. We'd move an amendment to the Veterans Entitlements Act as well. Uh, and it, it just shows, uh, frankly, the, the complete uh, intellectual bankruptcy, I'd have to say, of the argument put forward by the minister in the previous debate, uh, uh, because the government refuses to progress legislation which sits in this Senate now on the notice paper uh, that would deal with all of these changes uh, en masse in a way that's completely consistent with the Human Rights Commission report, uh, which has examined the issue thoroughly over many months indeed examined it so thoroughly that that was the excuse the government gave for not referring that piece of legislation to a Senate committee, because they said it's already been examined by Herioc, the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commissioner, so we don't need to send it to a committee because they've already done the work. Uh, so that being the case, um, there's no reason not to proceed with that straight away. Obviously the government wouldn't do that, so uh, the next approach is to move amendments to each of those pieces of legislation, each of those acts as amending bills come through this chamber, and we've had many amending bills come through this chamber this week, uh, which provided many opportunities to remove this discrimination. Um, so, frankly, the argument that, the, um, that Senator Johnson put forward uh, as the minister in the previous debate to do with judges' pensions um, is simply specious. And uh, he may or may not have known, but um, certainly was there before him circulated in the chamber this particular amendment we're dealing with now specifically to remove that discrimination in regards to veterans' entitlements. Um, I would just read briefly from the summary from the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission report so that people are clear that this isn't just a matter of you know, some, some high-minded principle about equality or removal of discrimination. This is uh, uh, explicit and very direct negative impacts on veterans, and they are veterans. They are the government's speech in regard to this legislation, quite understandably and appropriately, talks about, and in glowing terms, the government's ongoing commitment to Australians' veterans' community and assist veterans who have been disabled as a result of their service for our country and our war widows and war widowers. Now, well, they should have a bracket after that saying, unless those veterans' uh, partners is of the same sex, then our commitment does not exist, or if the partner of that veteran. Uh, so. If you're a partner of a veteran, the government uh, is pleased to have this legislation before you for the chamber that demonstrates their ongoing commitment to you. Uh, unless uh, it's a same-sex partner, then they don't have any ongoing commitment to you. You don't have any entitlements at all, um, and that is um, that is simply the case. And to to draw from the findings of the Human Rights uh, and Equal Opportunity Commission, uh, Australian Defence Force veterans and their families and their families are generally entitled to a range of special benefits and entitlements in recognition of their military service. However, many of those benefits are not available to veteran same-sex couples and their children. Uh, so we have this range of special benefits and entitlements to veterans and their families in recognition of their special service, uh, but if your family consists of, and your partner consists of a same-sex partner, um, then there is not that recognition of your service. Why is it that your service in the Defence Force, a very special and important type of service to the Australian nation, is not recognised as completely and fully if your partner happens to be of the same sex? How is that showing commitment and recognition of the special contribution of military service. To use the examples or to detail the examples, same-sex partner of a veteran cannot access the following be benefits, war widow and widower's pension, the very specific benefit that we are increasing here um, quite appropriately 
and with the support of the Democrats. We support increasing by ten dollars a fort um, by um, Ten, um, by ten dollars a fortnight, the former domestic allowance component of war widows and widowers' pension, um, and amending the way it's indexed, we support that. Uh, but the simple fact is that uh, it's not available. It's available to opposite-sex partners of um, deceased veterans. It's not available to same-sex partners. Their contribution is less valuable. That is just a simple legal fact, as the law now stands. And it will remain that way until an amendment such as the one that I have put forward on behalf of the Democrats is passed. So same-sex partner of a veteran cannot access war widow or widower's pension. They cannot access bereavement payment. Uh, I would ask senators to think how that can feel. It shouldn't need that much imagination. Uh, when your partner dies, and this can be uh, in the case of veterans, uh, obviously in many cases partners of decades long standing, uh, and it's not just you don't get the payment, it's that you don't get the recognition. Your relationship with your partner, um, lifelong partner in some cases, who has just died, is not recognised. That, uh, I'd suggest, is something that uh, can strike very hard on people and it should not have to happen. So same-sex partners do not access, cannot access war widow, widower's pension, bereavement payment, gold repatriation card, income support supplement, partner service pension or military compensation. And I would say in passing military compensation also can include uh, the sort of people I was talking about in my second reading speech, all injured service persons. And to use a quote from one of the people that gave evidence to the um, Heriock inquiry, gay war veterans laid down, laid down their lives or were injured for our country. Same as heterosexual war veterans. They protected us. We should protect them and their families. Why are they families less deserving of being afforded this protection? Uh, I would like an answer to that question one day. Why are their families less deserving of being afforded this protection? Uh, there is no excuse for this continuing discrimination. And uh, once again, the Democrats uh, repeat our uh, commitment to continue to push on this issue until the discrimination is removed, uh, whether it's under the Veterans Entitlements Act or uh, the other uh, 57 pieces of legislation that were identified by the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission. The question is that amendments 1 to 5 on Senator Ludwig. Thank you, uh, Chair. The, uh, the Labor Party understands the position that the uh, Democrats are putting in respect of this debate. Uh, it is a matter that they have um, diligently been progressing uh, this evening in a range of other legislation and uh, during this week. The Labor Party's position on this is and has been articulated by me and by others. It's clear what we've said about these types of things is that if they are tagging amendments, we understand the principle, we support the principle, but we're not going to agree to the, uh, to the actual uh, amendment to the bill. This is, uh, on balance, one of those uh, in that frame. It's also a matter that we don't want to contribute uh, without some idea of what the cost would be. There's no costings that have been provided. As we've said, uh, uh, Kevin Rudd is a fiscal conservative and he's not going to then allow these things to uh, provide a, an attack on the uh, budget. We don't think, though, that they are matters that go to the budget issue per se. Uh, they are, by and large, moral issues. But what we think and what Labor has proposed is a way of dealing with this. Herioc, the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission, has provided a way forward. They have provided a model that Labor prefers. I do understand that uh, it differs uh, to the model that's being uh, put forward by the Democrats. We also think that the process of both an audit to have a look at the Commonwealth legislation uh, and the Commonwealth regulation and guidelines and procedures does need to be progressed in a meaningful way to ensure that there is a meaningful removal of uh, discriminatory provisions within legislation. It is no easy task uh, and it is even more difficult from opposition. On that basis, uh, we're, not going to, we're not prepared to uh, support uh, the amendment. I, that's why I don't use the phrase oppose uh, in this instance. Uh, I do understand that the Democrats have been consistent in this principle. 
but I think uh, the Democrats do understand the position that I've articulated. We do have a similar view, uh, perhaps just a different way of, of getting there. We're not going to uh, manage it from opposition by amending uh, their legislation. It is a matter that will take uh, some time for a government to do. Uh, we have heard this evening where the, uh, the minister representing the Attorney General in this House has said the government is considering it. Uh, I think the phrase, uh, although it seemed to warm his heart, I think the phrase uh, actually lacks uh, and is a little bit hollow. They have had 11 years to deal with this matter. The HEROC report has been uh, released and available, and they haven't uh, commented or provided a response to it in a meaningful way. Uh, that is a, a shame. Uh, and this government, as in, even in its last uh, week of sitting, uh, potentially, if you uh, believe the, uh, the Treasurer, has, uh, has not uh, really provided any support, any clear direction in this area by saying we will or we will commit to or we will uh, in fact use the we will or the coalition will phrase. What they've been doing is saying considering and unfortunately we think uh, from Labor's perspective we know what that in fact means. It means we'll consider it for a very, very long time and uh, try not to do anything unless absolutely forced into it or have to do it or in fact, uh, it becomes uh, another considered thing we'll just consider. The question is that amendment, uh, the minister. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just for the record, the government uh, does not support the proposed amendments. The government's position uh, on this issue is very clear and well known. And I think uh, uh, Senator Johnson in the previous debate outlined the government's uh, position in more detail. I won't traverse the same ground and uh, detain the Senate any longer. Uh, but this is a a matter which was the subject of the uh, Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission report, which was handed down three months ago, and the government's considering that report. But certainly, uh, in this, uh, uh, in relation to these amendments, uh, the government is opposed to them. Question is, uh, Senator Bartlett. Thank you. Just very briefly, look, I understand the position both the minister and shadow minister have taken. I'd I thought Senator Johnston's contribution and reasons were actually somewhat at odds with the reasons given by a range of other ministers at various other uh, similar amendments around the place, but uh, it's neither here nor there. I think the bottom line is the government's not going to do it, and uh, I think it's pretty clear what the other reasons are why the government's not going to do it, because we all know they could have done it years ago. They did do it in regard to superannuation, um, uh, at least part of it uh, some years ago. Uh, eventually, after a lot of pressure from the Democrats, and the, they could have done it a long time ago if they wanted to do it, uh, and they haven't, and that's that's obviously clear. Uh, in regard to, to Labor's position, uh, again, I understand it. I appreciate the need for costings or the desirability of costings. I, I do think it's a bit of a problematic argument to use, uh, I must say, in the in the sense that. Um, Obviously, these costings of or this measure of uh, 400 plus million dollars uh, that we're about to pass um, yeah, wasn't on the table yesterday. It's suddenly there now, so that money can appear pretty quickly when the political desire is there. And I, I'm wary of the principle of uh, whether or not you can you know, afford to remove discrimination um, and say, well, we, we'd like to remove discrimination, but we can't actually afford it, um, particularly in the current fiscal environment where we obviously could afford it. So I understand it on principle, but I think in a practical sense it uh, it's, has its problems. But either way, um, we shall persevere. One day sh we shall succeed. question is that Democrats' amendments 1 to 5 on sheet 5404 revised be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the noes have it. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Veterans Entitlements Amendment Disability War Widow and War Widower Pensions Bill 2007 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. And that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. We now read a third time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it.
Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Veterans Entitlements Act 1986 and for related purposes. Higher Education Support Amendment extending FEE help for VET diploma, advanced diploma, graduate diploma and graduate certificate courses, Bill 2007. A message has been received from the House of Representatives forwarding the Higher Education Support Amendment extending fee help for VET diploma, advanced diploma, graduate diploma and graduate certificate courses, Bill 2007 for concurrence. Minister. This bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. And Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Higher Education Support Act 2003 and for related purposes. Minister. I take a revised explanatory uh, memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read uh, a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. So leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Carr. I seek uh, leave to incorporate my second reading remarks. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Question, question is the bill be read a second time? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Higher Education Support Act 2003 and for related purposes. Minister. Read a third time. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Higher Education Support Act 2003 and for related purposes. I propose the question that the Senate do now adjourn. <laughs> it's good night and good luck. <laughs> well done, Chris. The Senate stands adjourned until Monday, the 15th of October, at 12:30 p.m.